It's time for the show that brings the magic right to your speakers. Ears up. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the show, Ears Up Podcast. Here we are. We uh, This is the, the show that we've been talking about for a couple of months now. Um, this is the interview with Josh Freeze. And uh, normally, this is the part of the show where I just sort of BS and tell you, you know, how to buy stuff that we sell. Um, but I'm not going to do that because I value Josh's time too much. Josh is a, a very important, uh, you know, famous person, and uh, he doesn't want to hear me shill my Etsy page. So, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, I, so you know, we'll do all that stuff at the end, and you know, take our little break and everything. But can I share, no... can I share my Etsy page? You do actually the whole interview, every <laughs> response to my questions should just be your Etsy page, yes, and that's yeah. really it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Josh, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate you uh, you being here, and it, it took a bit, um, you know, schedule wise. But uh, like I said, you're you, you are a busy dude, and uh, going through your history and your musical history, you are a very busy dude. <laughs> and I want to get to all that, but basically, why I'm here is your connection to Disneyland. Uh, you know, you started your musical career um, essentially playing at the Tomorrowland Terrace stage in Tomorrowland at Disneyland. And then uh, your your dad, of course, was the famous Stan Freeze, who led the not only the uh, Disneyland band, but basically was chartered with creating the Disney World band. Yep. Long time. So you're a big, uh, you have Disney in your blood, as they say, <laughs> I guess. I actually spent all afternoon talking about it with someone that I was recording with today, because I was recording with this, this young artist up in Los Angeles. She's probably, I don't know, 21, 22 years old. And... Uh, when, she, when I said, she says, where'd you, you grew up in Southern California, right? I said, yeah, I grew up down there. And she actually is from, I'm going to get the name of the town wrong, but she lived, uh, it's funny that you guys are up in the East Bay because she's from the East Bay, uh, somewhere like near Walnut Creek, you know, somewhere in that. Okay. Is there a place called Danville? Yeah. Danville. Danville. Is that what it is? Danville? Okay. Yeah, that's where I'm from. Okay. <laughs> she's from Danville, but, but her family lives down here in Los Angeles now. And she goes, Oh, so where in Southern California you grew up? I said Orange County, and she goes, "Oh, she goes, she goes. Do you ever go to Disneyland?" And I went, "Don't, <laughs> don't get me started on Disneyland stuff, right?" <laughs> and so we, she's a total Disney nerd, and so as we we're like, and her parents showed up, and her parents are really, really cool, and they love it as well. And it got to the point where like some of these musicians in the room, and the engineers that were running the studio, and the producer was like, "You guys need to stop." geeking out about this stuff and like we got like we'd have to get back to work you know because I'm sitting there telling all these stories and telling my whole history and when she said you know or when anybody says you know if you've been to Disneyland much I say I literally grew up there you know it's like my parents growing up in Minneapolis but dad they, they moved to Orlando in I guess 71 I think it was uh when Disney World opened, my dad got the job conducting the Disney World band down in Orlando. So I was born at the end of 72 down there, but consider myself a California native because probably at about, you know, nine or 10 months old while I'm still in diapers and crawling and, you know, can't talk yet. We moved to, my dad got transferred to Anaheim to work at Disneyland and conduct the band out here. So we came out here and all my earliest memories and even I've got pictures, my parents have all these pictures of my brother and I we would like march up and down Main Street with the Disneyland band when I was, you know, four. My brother's two with like plastic saxophones, like fake saxophones and clarinets, and go to Town Square. They were, where they would do like a they used to do like a set or two early in the afternoon, like late morning in Town Square, and then the same marching band would then do like a jazz set or two in uh, at Carnation Plaza, which is no longer there. It's called something else now. I was there recently. And I never really walked past it much because it kind of they transformed it into something else a while ago. It's like another stage, but it's a little bit smaller and it's there's some weird fantasy land tie in theme to it. It looks totally different than it looked in yeah. the 70s and 80s. And uh, but I go watch my dad conduct the big band. And that was really, you know, you were saying how my music career did start at Disneyland at, in Tomorrowland, which we'll get to in a minute. And, and it did. But I, I feel like my musical career really started when I was, you know, a toddler and just being at Disneyland watching all these great musicians play. And there was a lot of great musicians that came through that band. And Disneyland was, a, I think, a good place to work, especially for freelance musicians who were, or, 
kind of would normally be living paycheck to paycheck and, and scrambling for gigs. All of a sudden they go, oh, wow, I've got this gig where I can play five days a week and I've got my family has health insurance and, uh, you know, I'm around a bunch of other great musicians and it, it's a steady thing. And that, that, that goes a long way, I think, you know, for uh, guys that would normally be freelance. So I, I grew up just watching these guys play and being around it all the time. And that's kind of what, you know, attracted me to, uh, to the drums. Like, you know, I, I, I attempted the trumpet for a minute, like at age six or seven, but I, and my brother and I used to laugh because we both went through a phase where we wanted to play trumpet. But once again, because at Disneyland, we didn't want to play regular trumpets. We wanted to play those super long, they're called herald trumpets. Yeah. really really long and sometimes like uh the toy soldiers would play them in parades like they would lip sync them. they'd have these long things they'd walk around and pretend to be playing them but there was guys that would go up in the castle and play them and they looked really cool they looked extra regal and majestic right yeah and, uh, it's funny though looking back at pictures there's pictures you know when i said i played trumpet for a minute there's pictures though literally of me probably three years old or four years old not knowing i was going to be a drummer and not practicing drums or uh, specifically trying to play the drums, but lots of pictures of me with drumsticks out of Disneyland, uh, you know, when I was, like I said, at pr probably preschool or something. Uh, so I was running all the time. And also there was things like at Carnation Plaza, they'd always have these like kind of big band summer things that would happen there. And they would have like the Glenn Miller Orchestra one week and the Tommy, Dory or, uh, Tommy Dorsey Orchestra and uh, Count Basie and the late great jazz drummer, Buddy Rich, who was, you know, arguably one of the most famous and greatest drummers that ever lived. Uh, Buddy Rich, his big band would always play Carnation Plaza like the last week for the blowout of the summer, like the last week of summer, uh, the summer schedule of big bands would be the Buddy Rich band. And because of my dad's affiliation and because that was kind of his stage normally, uh, I'd get to sit like on the side of the stage and watch Buddy Rich play drums when I was nine, 10 years old. And it just was mind blowing. I've got great pictures with them. And uh, anyways, so my dad, I guess when I was about around that time, I was about 10 or 11, my dad starts hiring the music out at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he went to, someone called him that was managing a band. Uh, they were the champions of Junior Star Search. A junior star search was like, you know, before American Idol, right? There was star search in the eighties and they had junior star search. And there was a span of these teenagers that, you know, were all, they, they were great. They were all great players and they played top 40 music and they had some originals, of course, but my dad hires them. They come out to Disneyland and, and I became fast friends with them. Um, that summer, summer 85, I like to, I like to brag that I've never really had a real job, you know? And uh, I was thinking that <laughs> I think the closest I ever had to having a real job. Okay. I had a paper route when I was like in fourth grade for a minute. Right. Paper sure. route. Uh, but in the summer of 85, I shine shoes backstage at Disneyland. There's an area uh, they're used. I don't know if it's still there or not, but Disneyland has a, uh, at least had a barbershop backstage just for the employees. It was called uh the cast cutters or something like that. It was a guy named Gary <laughs> Dye. Gary Dye was the barber there for years and years and years. And we actually have pictures of me, I think when I was like like a year and a half or two years old on my dad's lap, uh, getting a haircut and crying uh, because uh, whatever, I was like an infant and I'm on my dad's lap. And it, it was actually this, I know I'm all over the place. So forgive me of like talking. I, I start, as my wife calls it, bird walking. I start going this way, <laughs> that way, but uh, we'll get back around to whatever I was trying to get at soon. Um, I guess it's better, than, it's better than having a guest that doesn't talk, right? Um, yeah, I'm actually and, relieved. You're, you're basically <laughs> copying my notes where it's like, here's a thing and then this tangent, and then maybe yeah. they tie together. Yeah, scene. yeah. So anyway, yeah, we've got this funny film that's like super rate where there's no sound, but they like dub in funny music in the background, but it's me on my dad's lap getting my first haircut backstage at Disneyland and I'm crying and they're all kind of laughing because like, oh my God, this poor kid. And of course they're not doing anything bad to me, but I'm really upset. I'm crying and the Dapper Dans, the uh, barbershop quartet, they're in there singing, trying to like cheer me up, but you don't hear it. So you hear this goofy like elevator music in the background and it's, you know, 1970s, super eight, crummy, grainy film, you know? Uh, so cut to 
you know, 11 years later, I'm 12 years old. And my dad's like, hey, Josh, for summer job, you want to shine shoes backstage at Disneyland? You know, I can we can teach you in 20 minutes how to shine shoes. I go, sure. great. And what was cool is I got to go into work with my dad every day. Well, it didn't have to be every day. What was cool is it was this shoe shine stand or whatever with a seat you get up on all that stuff right outside cast cutters and uh and directly next door to where all the characters like checked in all their outfits and heads and all this stuff uh mm -hmm. the great thing is that i had the shoe shine box that i could lock and unlock at the bottom but i could go in whenever i wanted i can work as long as i wanted so it wasn't i never had a boss saying you got to be here at 9 a.m tomorrow or you're fired hey you were five <laughs> minutes late today there's none of that it's like show up and work as long as you want or not. You know I mean? As much money as I felt like trying to make that day. So sometimes I'd be there for an hour and a half, two hours. Sometimes I'd be there all day long. I could not show, you know, it was kind of in and out of there all summer. And that's when that band was playing there. I became friends with them. And mm -hmm. by the end of the summer, you know, I was jumping up and sitting in on songs. They'd have, they'd let me come up and play a song with them. And then they mm -hmm. said, you, know what? you should just join our band. We should have two drummers. And so I joined the band. I had all these cool electronic drums, right? So they said, oh yeah, well, you know, we'll have an acoustic drummer on the side of the stage and I'll play the electronic drums. So I worked out there uh, between 85 and 88. And, uh, you know, we played five sets a day uh, during the school year, because we all went to school. I was the youngest one in the band. When I, when I started with them, I was 12 and the oldest guy was 18. And then the other four members were in between that, like a 16 year old, a couple 14 year olds. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, we play every weekend because we go to school during the week. And then during the summertime, we play like three or four nights a week, five sets a night. And uh, and it was awesome. I mean, I joke around. I said this three hours ago up in the valley when I was recording today that I always say it's been downhill ever since then. <laughs> it really was so much fun. It was really such a fun experience. I was 12, 13 years old. Not only did I want to play drums in front of people, that was exciting enough getting to perform in front of people, you know, yeah. and, uh, but then to join the musicians union and actually get paid. So all my friends were like hating the fact they were having to mow someone's lawn for 10 <laughs> bucks. I was making like 300 bucks every weekend, you know, mm. 400 bucks every weekend, just playing the drums. I was like, this is insane. This is so great. Was and that, uh, is Polo, the band. Yeah. Yeah. The band was called Polo. And, uh, yeah. and then by the time I was 15 and we stopped working out there, I never wanted to go to Disneyland again. I was like, I'm really? here every day of my freaking life since I was born. I'm sick and tired of Disneyland. So I didn't go for a while. I would end up there for, for a while. Like my dad say, hey, there's this thing on Saturday night and we're having this dinner or I'm getting an award for this or that or this, you know. So we'd go there for things, but I never really paid much attention. You know, when I was my late teens, early 20s, I'm like, I'm, I'm over the Disney crap, right? And uh, yeah. it wasn't until... We started, uh, I met my wife and we started having kids that I then rediscovered it as an adult and, uh, and as a parent. And then really like, when I went back into enjoying it again, uh, getting into like the history of Walt Disney, the person and his story and, and his, his uh, you know, rags to riches story and, uh, and I, I, I became kind of fascinated with that and also seeing it through my kids' eyes, but then also looking back and realizing, God, this is a huge part of my family. Like this has been my whole family, like my whole childhood was there, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we joke around, like even friends of mine that, you know, have had a rough childhood or something, they always go, well, Josh literally grew up at Disneyland. Like <laughs> you grew up at Disneyland. So like, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's like I've become one of those uh, one of those weird adults that's really the Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> like you all. Yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah. Are, are, yeah. Who's where? Oh, someone jumped in the front. Oh, sorry. That was my daughter saying goodnight. <laughs> no. How dare she? <laughs> How dare she? I'm going to cut her out of the show. <laughs> um, are you are you a Disney Parks guy? Uh, well, I, I, I differentiate myself between like Disney movies disney movie people like disney brand people or like disney parks people i'm a disney parks person yeah okay yeah Thank you. yeah you know what i mean like i mean the brand yeah it's great whatever i mean i've got uh i just found the other day one of my kids must have had it and i didn't see it for a while but i have this great like 
light green and yellow. It looks it looks vintage, but it's not. It's probably about four years old. A great tiki room shirt. Oh, oh do I got to show you? Yeah, do it. It's literally no, no, no. It's something else, and it's going to take about. It's probably going to take less than sixty seconds for me to grab. And you have to see it's it. right outside, uh, rotting away outside. I got to show it to you. Just talk amongst yourselves. I'll be right back. Hold on. I hope it's a, a full Mickey Mouse head. That'd be amazing. <laughs> It's a it's a person it's a cast member in the costume. He's like, Josh, <laughs> let me go home. It's been Please. 40 years. <laughs> Leave me alone. I want to see my family. I'm assuming they're still alive. <laughs> his life is a dream. Life could or be his, a dream. his childhood. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. I love that it's just like, yeah, here I got this thing. Hold on. Mm -hmm. And he's very excited about it. That's I love it. fun. Well, he's a drunk. I mean, if he's excited, I'm excited about it. Yeah. I know. <laughs> What is it going to be? It Who literally, knows? it could be anything. It's a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> and that's sort of what I ask them. Like, have you stolen stuff from the park? <laughs> I mean, you, you got to do it, especially if you're 12 and you see something behind, you know, backstage, like <laughs> literally nobody's going to miss this. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to snag this. I would 100% be that person. Absolutely. <laughs> oh. Uh, while waiting for Josh, uh, uh, guys uh, in the chat, I, uh, I, I, I put I put a link out and then um, I'm still trying to figure Zoom out. So uh, you know we switched to Zoom and uh, I gave everyone the wrong link. So sorry about that. Everybody. This thing's been in the same place for like a year, and I go out to look at for it in the dark, and I yelled at the how it's not there, and I said to my son, "Where'd that thing go?" He's like, "It's in the basement." Okay, so this used to be this used to be brightly colored. It had all the tiki room. Uh, characters the the little tiki gods that are outside in the uh in the garden there you could hit a light and uh i mean it obviously didn't have holes in the roof <laughs> you hit a light and the whole thing lit up like at night oh. and this thing in the front that says the chinese room would all light up it's all like stuff's falling off on me it's like so what happened was i made the mistake years ago it was beautiful it was only 300 bucks originally um I want to say they're almost impossible to find now. And I saw one on eBay for like 1300 bucks a, Holy crap. Of, a while ago. It was beautiful. It was awesome. Somehow my kids started messing with it. All the pieces eventually got uh, lost. Even the, uh, yep. the, the God Pele, who the fire comes out, had huh? a little yep. fire thing. And you could flip the back of them, flip the back of the switch and the fire. Uh, it was a light <laughs> that lit up on top of his head. Mm -hmm. It was so freaking cool. Awesome. And, uh, and so anyways, over time, it started getting messed with, and then a kid this, and then that, and then things, pieces got lost, and then, a, then a, maybe a dog peed on it, and it go, went outside for a minute, then it got rained on. Anyways, my wife a couple years ago was like, this thing, I mean, it's trashed, right? It is trashed. <laughs> and my, my wife was like, we got to throw this thing out. I mean, it's, you know, it's big. She's like, let's just throw that Dude. thing out. I'm like, no, just let yeah. them, like live in the yard, like in the corner, and we'll let stuff <laughs> grow on it, and it'll just become, you know. Oh, yeah. So it's been on the side of our house forever, and I uh, so I go out just now in the dark. I'm like, oh, I'll grab it. I know exactly where it is. I saw it yesterday. I go out there. They were cleaning in the yard, and it's not there. So I'm having to like bang in the house. Like, where the hell is that picky room? Uh, <laughs> so I'm really, I'm always sad. I'm glad I still have it. I'm really sad that it's in such horrible shape because it was so cool before. Um, but, uh, you know, it's funny we're talking about this because these people, I was telling you, this this girl I recorded with this afternoon in the studio, we talked a bunch of Disney stuff. And, uh, and yeah, the parks, it's like, you know, so, yeah, I like some of the memorabilia. I've got some, maybe I'll have my wife grab some. I've got some great Haunted Mansion figurines and stuff in the house. Mm -hmm. I don't have a big collection. I don't have, a, like, a room where you go, oh, my gosh, I got this Disney stuff. I just see there's little things kind of around the house, you know? Um, I think that's the way um, to go. Yeah. You know, there's not like you don't want, I mean, no offense if anyone's got a crazy ass Disney room. I don't have a Disney room, but I've got Disney stuff throughout the house, little bits yeah. and pieces of things. Not back here. This is my wife's kind of office back here. But uh, this afternoon when, we, when I was talking to these people, it's like I kind of went through the whole, the fact that, you know, the only park I've never been to is the one in Shanghai, which I heard is great. I heard it's really big. It's really mm -hmm. nice. I yeah. I have to say my least favorite one is Hong Kong. Oh really? Yeah. Why is that? Have you if you guys ever have you been 
to many other Disney parks? Uh, only Disney World. I think I can, I can say that for all of us. Yeah, just just uh, East and West Coast. That's it. Well, I've been to Disney Japan. But... Oh, that's right. You've been to Tokyo Disney. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But she was like eight or something. She no, I was remember. 18, but I, for oh. some reason, can't okay. remember any of it. Well, you know, <laughs> drug. I have the shrimps, but. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Tokyo Disneyland probably three or four times. But uh, what I think is really cool, and next time I'm in Japan, last time I went there to the, the Tokyo one, mm -hmm. it's because it was pouring rain and I, I went by myself when I, we were there and I only had a, like a couple nights off and no one really wanted to go. I said, screw it, I'm just gonna go like trip around by myself, it'll be awesome. But while I was going there, it's about a half an hour outside of downtown Tokyo. It started raining and I'm there and I'm going, oh, this, kind of, this kind of sucks. So. Uh, but what's great is their sister park, just like here we have, you know, uh, California Adventure. Uh, mm -hmm. Their sister park is, is called Disney Sea. Yeah. S -E -A, mm -hmm. And it's super cool. Like That's next time I'm in Japan, I might just go to Disney Sea and not go to the Magic Kingdom necessarily. Gotta do it. You gotta is, do it. It's really interesting looking. It's really cool. And uh, it's, I've heard, uh, I don't watch a lot of these guys, but I know, because I think I met him years ago, there's the Imagineer that's kind of famous because he's always in some special talking about stuff. And he's not one of the old guys. He's one of the, I mean, he's probably 60 now, but he was one of the younger guys is Tony Baxter. The guy that you saw, yeah. Yeah. And Tony Baxter, I read somewhere or saw him say that I think he thinks Disney Sea is the most beautiful and the coolest looking park out of any of the other parks. Wow. It's really unique and special and different yeah. than any of the other places you'll see. Um, we were laughing today and I told the story that the first time I went to Paris Disneyland, I've, I've been to Paris Disneyland probably, probably half a dozen times. Right. And, uh, and it's, it's cool. I like the Paris Disneyland a lot. And, uh, but the first time I went there, you know, the punk rock band I've played in since I was 17, the Vandals, the Vandals are all Disney guys. Are uh, they really? Oh yeah. I well, can't, you're, 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 you're fracturing my childhood right now. I'm going to rephrase that. Joe okay. Escalante and the Vandals is such a big Disney guy alongside me that it makes every one of the Vandals seem like Disney guys. The other guys don't mind Disney. <laughs> they, they like it, but they're not. Joe and I are the Disney freaks and the other two guys are like, oh, this is cool. You know, they, you know, whatever. But in 1997, the Vandals, we were in Europe and we were on tour opening up for No Doubt. And it was I, one of their first times playing in Europe and they were, they have just become kind of, fam you know, famous. And we we're playing these bigger, you know, big arenas and big uh, venues. And when we were going to get to Paris, you know, when we realized, oh, we're going to be in Paris and we're not going to have a day off, but we all, you know, and we'd all been to Paris before, maybe only once or twice, but we've been there before. Uh, we didn't have a day off, but we re we realized, okay, if we blow off sound check, <laughs> we, could, we could conceivably, if we wake up early, we could take the subway, because it's about, you know, I don't know, it's about 40 minutes outside of town. Uh, we could go to Disney, spend the afternoon at Disney and get back at like, I don't know, safely get back at like six, you know, six o'clock and play our gig, right? And so we were gone all day and the, the no doubt folks, it might've been maybe their first time there or whatever. And once again, we didn't have any time off. So they're rushing around trying to see, you know, the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre and all this stuff. And they could not believe, and no one else could believe they're like, we have one afternoon in Paris and you jackasses went to Disneyland. <laughs> we all from Orange County. <laughs> you know? Don't we all already live there? I'm like, yeah, we got it. But when we went, uh, interestingly enough, we didn't work, we didn't plan for it to be like this or anything, but we happened to go there on the, the fifth. It was the exactly the five year anniversary of the day that we went there. And, uh, and of course, you know, before we got there, I said to my dad, I said, Hey, dad, let's pick a date. You know, dad, April 15th, you know, we're going to be in, uh, in Paris. You know, can you hook us up with tickets? He's like, Oh, yeah, I can hook you up with guys. You guys are tickets. <laughs> Great. So we get there. And also me growing up and like my dad, especially back then when Disney was a little less corporate and it was easier to get around. I mean, I would spend every weekend, we would just like all my friends in the neighborhood would pile into my dad's station wagon. We drew, would just, just drive right backstage and let us out right behind Space Mountain. We'd run around. They didn't find anybody in. 
We didn't have to go through any metal detectors. We didn't have to take any trams anywhere. We literally just would, or he'd drop us off right behind somewhere in Main Street. We'd walk out right behind the Penny Arcade or we're in Disneyland, you know? So that was how, I didn't see a parking lot. I didn't see the Disneyland parking lot until I was about 20 years old. <laughs> but literally, my whole life, I, we would just go directly behind there. That's, and I was like, I couldn't, it was weird. It was actually weird to me when I started having to park outside <laughs> and go in. I was like, what the hell? So anyways, me growing up, my dad knew everybody. He was really sociable and whatever. And uh, so I just thought my dad like ran Disneyland. I forgot he just was part of the music division. And uh, but I thought he was like the vice president of Disneyland. Right. So we go over to Paris. I'm like, yeah, of course my dad's gonna hook us up. We get there, we wait in the will call line to get our tickets. We get up there uh, and I say, yeah, you know, Josh Freeze, I should have four tickets here. And they look and they go, no, there's nothing here. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, check again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Stan Freeze left them uh, for me, and there should be four tickets for today. And they look again. No, there's like, dude, no, see your name. I'm like, trust me. Like, you know, and my dad even told me, hey, if there's a problem, say so and so's name and so and so's name. So I'm name dropping names. They're looking at me like, what are you Damn. talking about? Yeah. <laughs> they then speak in French to someone, they call someone over. They're looking at the thing and they're pointing to me, and, it's, <laughs> and they look, I go, and I'm like, they realize I'm not going to take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the line is getting longer behind me. And I turn around and people are like going, what the hell is happening up there? Like, what is going on? I'm up there for 10, 15 minutes. The, the guy finally just goes, here. He just gives me four tickets. Like, get out of here. <laughs> like, you don't want to deal with me anymore. You're and European. So like, wow, we weren't really on the list after all. But I just, I, I was determined. And I must have looked like someone that knew that was supposed to have tickets it wasn't like hey, you think we could maybe get four tickets um uh, i was like come on i'm on the list look again you know yeah. uh mickey right. mouse left tickets for me <laughs> guys this will work don't worry yeah yeah so we went and and it was great and uh you know it was just it was all special for me going to one of the new parks after going to disneyland seventeen thousand times it was always a trip like going where you go okay i'm walking down main street now I'm going to make a left and be in Adventureland. But you make a left and there's some like, maybe fantasy lands. They're like, whoa, no, no, no. That's supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah. I thought, and so you're like, well, yeah, I'm not at Disneyland, you know? That's how being at Disney World was for sure. Especially uh, where it's like you, you walk down Main Street and you're automatically sort of in the twilight zone because things are the same, but they're wider. Mm -hmm. you yeah. know, corridor like there's a walking path you're like where i don't and this is i don't i don't know what's happening right now and then you're like liberty square like i'm really lost i yeah. have no idea what's going on i bet that's disorienting i said uh one analogy that i made was like uh especially i, I did a funny i i shortened it down to one minute so i could put it on instagram but when i went to hong kong disneyland uh when i left it was like uh well no even some of the other parks it's kind of like uh it's like you're hearing your favorite song that you've heard a thousand times before, but it gets to a section of the song while you're singing and all of a sudden it changes. And you're like, <laughs> well, no, 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 that's not supposed to happen in the bridge of that Beatles song. I've heard it a million <laughs> times yet. Well, what is that? So you yeah. make a left turn and it, all of a sudden, just when you think you've got it all figured out, it's totally upside down. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, you know, what was cool, the, the Hong Kong Disneyland is a, uh, I was really excited. It was the first time I went to any Disney park on my own was this time that I went and, and uh, the people I was on tour with, I was there with Sting and his band. And not only, you know what? I didn't think I invited anybody. <laughs> Honestly, I wanted to go by myself. I was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put on a backpack. I'm gonna take like the, the subway. Yeah. I'm just gonna go hang up by myself and not have anybody slowing me down and go, no, I don't want to do that. Or why are we here doing it? And I'm just gonna go and do whatever I want to do. And I get there and one bummer was it was really hot and humid that day. It was in the summertime, but uh, but it was really empty and it was mm. so cool. And I did this little, I, I, I edited it down to one minute, but I put up a post of my little, within 60 seconds, my day at Hong Kong Disneyland. Yeah. And when I walked in, I go, uh, I go, God, this looks a lot like, you know, when you first walk in, Town Square looks a lot like, and they had the fire station and City Hall. And I go, this looks a lot like Disneyland, but you know what I really like? I go, there ain't nobody here. <laughs> it was like empty. You could like roll a bowling ball almost down Main Street and not hit anybody. It was wow. pretty wild. It was really empty. And uh, 
But I went on Thunder Mountain there. Okay. Oh no, you know it's funny. It wasn't you that earlier the 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 dad that I was talking to was like, I love Thunder Mountain. He was talking about how much he loved Thunder Mountain, and uh, I'm going to tell you one more little quick thing, then I'll let you ask something because you probably like you know. <laughs> But the, the the thunder the I think two of the best roller coasters by the way, yeah. they're both in Paris is the Space Mountain in Paris and the Thunder Mountain in Paris. The Space Mountain in Paris is fast as hell. It starts by you're up like this and mm -hmm. you go, but it just shoots you up and you're like holy shit and you go up and uh, there's it goes upside down. You know, it goes upside down at one point in the dark, which Space Mountain does not do, right? Bro, no. <laughs> really fast, uh, and it is a little more intense uh, than, uh, than the Space Mountain Anaheim. And then what's cool about the Thunder Mountain ride in in, uh, in Paris is you board on the uh, on land, and it's right by, it's, it's kind of like nearish kind of where it is, like in Anaheim, like right there, the river's there. Mm -hmm. But instead of Tom Sawyer's Island on the other side, yeah. That's where Thunder Mountain is, but you board here, you get, there's an entrance here, you get on the train and it goes in a tunnel under the water and you come up on this island and the whole ride takes place out on this island. And then when the ride's done, you haul back and, and you That's get tight. Out of the water and you come back to land. And it's, it's, I love it. So it's, Thunder Mountain's like floating in the middle of this island, on this island in the middle of the water. It feels like a lot of the European parks have cooler stuff than we do. Yeah, we, you know what's funny is, uh, it, you know what it is? I, I want to say that the, it might be the biggest uh, castle is the one in Paris. I might be wrong. Maybe because uh, they have a hotel in there, right? You can, they have like room. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Not sure. I'm yeah. not sure, possibly. Um, wow. But anyways, I mean, I could, sorry, I can go on and on about your little <laughs> anecdotes. And no, and, and I want you to, but I do have, I do have like some questions. Um, you know, you were talking Tokyo Sea or uh, Tokyo Disneyland. Your dad worked in Tokyo Disneyland, did he not? Did I get that right? Yeah he, yeah, he did. But I mean, he would do a bunch of consulting for them. And then he would fly over there once in a while and be over there for okay. like a month. But it was always just kind of like maybe to oversee some things and maybe help them get something into shape. And then he would leave. But he, okay. he never spent a whole lot of time there. Not but he either. definitely did more consulting in, I don't know of him going to do anything in, in, in Paris or in China, but mm -hmm. definitely in Florida and definitely in, uh, in Japan, he's gone over to help with stuff, you know? Okay. And you were talking about, uh, you know, when, when you guys moved from Florida to Orange County, uh, I happened upon a, a news or not even a news clip it was like a talk show with your dad and, uh, and some lady. And he was, he, the way he tells the story about the way you guys basically fled Florida <laughs> was because he's like, I can't take the hundred percent humidity. It's a hundred degrees and the alligators and the snakes were too much. Like I couldn't deal with it. <laughs> so Those would be all of my reasons as well. <laughs> you might do. I'm like, God, this guy's like in my head. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so I found that really funny where you're like, well, he, you know, he transferred back to Anaheim. It's like, no, he left. <laughs> yeah, you know it's funny. I'm not sure. I gotta ask him, and actually, I, I really don't know this answer. But I forget if he raised his hand and said, "Can I please go work in Anaheim?" It or if they like just it. said, "You're going to Anaheim." I, I don't know how that. I've never even thought about that. I just know we got transferred, but maybe he put in a request. Maybe I don't know. I, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think he was there for two years, um, and. Uh, yeah, and then and then he and then he he ripped back, uh, you know, ripped to uh, to Anaheim. So how long was he the uh, the Disneyland band leader? <clears throat> well, from seventy one to uh, God, uh, probably about I could be wrong, but probably till about eighty three or eighty four, and that's when he got the promotion to oversee all the live music, and then he was in charge of, you know. There you the, go. the marching band and the rock band and the jazz band and the Dixieland band and the Dapper Dance and any, any live music that was happening there. He was one of the guys that was in charge of, as I say, kind of hiring and firing of musicians out there and kind of making sure that all the shows were running smoothly. And uh, and then, you know, it's funny. I know he did miss. He was great. I remember going to see him with the Disneyland band uh, in Carnation Plaza do these jazz sets. And he was a great MC. Like, you know, he really always, he didn't just conduct the band. Like he was kind of a ham and he'd have to you know, talk in between songs and he carried the whole show, you know? And uh, sure. I remember watching that when I was a kid. I thought that was the actual doing this, 
wasn't nearly as impressive to me as just the fact that he could kind of command the microphone and and do that you know i've been on stage yeah. my entire life but i've never had to be on the microphone the microphone actually kind of terrifies me for a guy, for a guy that can talk this much yeah. you know, well, i'm on stage someone gives me a microphone i'm like <laughs> it's yeah, it's overload. I mean, well, it the drums. I can kind of hide behind the drums, and that's know. right. Well, until you have the the Josh cam, and then you know, yeah. and then people get to see you smile all the time. Uh, okay. You know, it's in researching the show and, and researching your dad. Your dad was on Hee Haw. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. yeah, and so on his YouTube channel, I think there's like only four or five videos. Uh, so you should check it out. The Stan Freeze. But it's it's you know he would write songs for the tuba. He's a big tuba player. Sousaphone, I think, is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And he would write these skits and write these songs, like sort of like country western songs, but about the tuba. It's it's sort of classic. But it, it sort of like mimics your career in a way, like with the Vandals, like you know, and then your solo work, sort of writing these, you know, funny, you know, uh, I don't want to say yeah. off color. I mean, for you know, it's a, a country song about a tuba, but <laughs> it's you know things that you don't really expect. And so I can definitely see him emceeing, leading a band because he, I mean, he's. That was 30 years, you know, after he was on TV, on Hee Haw, for God's sakes. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that when he was, uh, when he went to kind of like have his now kind of office job, even though he was around the park all day long, he wasn't just sitting behind a desk. Um, but, you know, when he had the promotion of, 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 of overseeing all the live music, he missed it after a while. And so he kind of like, it's almost like he kept his job as, as music supervisor uh, I don't know exactly what his title was, but I just know that he had everything. He oversaw the live music, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, but it got to the point where at one point they needed a conductor, you know, for the Disneyland band. They were or they needed a sub for a month or whatever it was. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to hire myself, damn it! And he <laughs> kind of started doing it part time again and really okay. enjoying it. Or like sometimes he, I forget. It was a time. It was during a time when I wasn't going out there a lot between the ages of you know whatever. Yeah. 15 and 25 or something you know and yeah. so i just remember the back of my head going he'd go like oh yeah i'm conducting the band this week or every night this week i'll be out of carnation plaza and so he kind of would do it just because it was fun for him and he, he, he didn't get to be on stage doing his shtick anymore now that he was a, a suit so to say <laughs> right. you know so to speak so <laughs> that's cool man so yeah. you were, you know, you're growing up in SoCal in, you know, late seventies, early eighties. Uh, and that was a big, you know, big music time back there. The SoCal punk scene was, was just growing and, and, and turned out to be super influential, but how does, how does a Disneyland kid get involved in, in, I don't know what you could sort of classically call like anti Disney sort of, you know, music scene. Well, what's funny. Well, the, the thing is, it just worked out the way it worked, but the Vandals, what's cool about the Vandals, the Vandals are an interesting group of people. And <laughs> uh, and in the way that, for instance, I'll give you a good example, you know, with this punk rock band that, you know, goes on, you know, uh, whatever, all, all these tours, all these other punk rock bands, but there's, there's not a single one tattoo amongst the four of us. No one in the Vandals has a tattoo. So we'll be hanging out like on, uh, I remember one time some of the guys from Rancid, we were on the work tour one summer with them and they were on a bike. We we're making hot dogs already. A Joe got this thing called the hot diggity dogger out of Sky Mall where you can put, it's like a toaster oven where on each side you can put <laughs> buns and then you put the hot dogs in the middle and you toast the buns and you can do like four hot dogs and four buns at the same time. That's road and food, then, yeah. And then, efficient. Yeah. I literally almost bought that. <laughs> so many times I'm, I, yeah. I swear to god i'm well, not kidding leave it to the vandals the vandals will buy that and bring it on tour so we had on our tour bus yeah. and people all day long no effects blink 182 rancid they all come by and want us to they're like let's go you know do shots and eat hot dogs with the van <laughs> tour bus and we'd be making hot dogs all day and joe even found out that, i don't know if they still make it but at least that some joe's the kind of guy um, he's a Club 33 member, by the way. I got I got him as Club 33 wow. membership. It's oh, a, damn. That's a whole other story. All right. Um, All right. But Joe's an interesting... He's, to say he's interesting is an understatement. But he would... Uh, he's the kind of guy that would know about this. And that summer, aside from having the hot diggity dogger, we had Heinz 57 ketchup, you know, in the squeeze bottle. But we had purple and... Uh, purple and blue or blue and green it was 
but it, it was just uh, you I can buy it. Yeah, it's, like the colored ketchup. Summer, or maybe you can, I don't know, maybe you, to, yeah. maybe you go to Vaughn's right now and get <laughs> maybe, uh, yeah. ketchup. I don't know. It's just food coloring. Yeah. But people would trip out. They're like, not only are you guys making hot dogs, but your ketchup is green or purple, literally purple ketchup. Tastes exactly like ketchup, but you're having a purple hot, you know. Yeah. So, so the, the Vandals, um, on one hand, yeah, we were the only band in the world, maybe a punk rock band or any kind of rock band, that there's not a single tattoo amongst the four of us. Wow. And, uh, and, and so anyways, I met them, the way I met them is, uh, I'll make this short because I'll get to the, the punchline is sort of a, I, I met the guitar player Warren through a, uh, uh, a mutual friend that's a record producer in Orange County. Yeah. And you know, all the music's happening up in LA and Hollywood, right? With all the recording studios and stuff. So Orange County is kind of a uh, smaller pond down here. You know, there's fewer. So when you hear about a record producer, like, oh, there's there's a famous record producer. Like, there, you know, there's not a lot of famous record producers in Orange County. At least there wasn't 30 years ago. And yeah. um, so I, I knew this guy, uh, John St. James. He introduces me to Warren. And Warren lived in Huntington Beach and goes, you know what I'm doing right now? He's not the original guitar player in the Vandals, but, you know, at this point the lineup's been the way it is for 30 years so most people don't know or care there was even any other people in the vandals before us before yeah. me and warren. but warren goes yeah i'm playing guitar with that, that band the vandals right now because this guy john wanted me and warren to meet up and like start a band he's like oh you guys would get along great uh because right. i'm playing guitar in the vandals right now uh as well and actually we kind of need a drummer and so i said oh that's interesting I, I knew the name i didn't know much about him i was okay. only like 16 but i was like oh yeah I know who that band is, and I was thought the name was cool for a, a punk rock band, the Vandals. Yeah. Like, wow, what a cool name! Um, and the fact that I'd heard of them and they had records out, I was like, "Whoa, that's really cool! It's really big time, right?" Um, so he goes and tells Joe Escalante, the bass player, and Dave Quackenbush, the singer. He says, "Hey, I met this guy. He's only 16, uh, and he used to play. I guess he played drums out at Disneyland for a while." And Joe and Dave. Joe tells the story in this Vandals home movie documentary thing. Joe goes, I think, oh my God, he's like, he didn't play in that band Polo. It's <laughs> all, it's all kids. Is he one of those guys? And, and Warren's like, I think that was his band. So anyways, Joe and Dave being at the time 19, 20 years old, living in Orange County. And back when you go to Disneyland, you could go, when you went on Monday, there'd be nobody there. Like you could pick a day and show up and nobody was there. Yeah. I mean, meaning you get on it now, forget about it. All bets are off. It's always crowded, right? Absolutely. Uh, so anyways, there was lots of, if it was raining out, you could go to Disneyland at 85. And because it was raining out, there would be nobody there. Now it's like tons of people go because they go, no one's going to go today because it's raining. That's all <laughs> no, including me. Right? Right. And then it was freaking empty, man. And uh, sometimes. So anyways, and also you could probably get an annual pass for i don't know 60 bucks 70 bucks well i give it to you so joe gave that annual passes and they'd go out there all the time and as joe explains in this vandals documentary he goes one of our favorite things is we'd go by and see this band of teenagers playing duran duran songs and huey lewis in the news and he goes on one hand we thought this is so like lame and goofy <laughs> Because on the other hand, we're like, God, these kids are really, actually really good musicians, like <laughs> really good, you know? And, uh, and so here it is, we meet, you know, a few years later and, uh, and they're like, man, we used to come see your band all the time, you know, half mm -hmm. clowning it, half going, oh my God, look at these guys. Look of course. At these guys. But yeah. Uh, yeah, they saw us plenty of times out there. And um, Joe was always like, oh my God, my dream is to be a Club 33 member. And I was like, well, you know that you can't just even if you have the money, you can't just show up and go, I want a membership. Like there's all this red tape and there's this, you know, mystery waiting list that yeah. is a mile long. We've and, tried and you never hear back and you're like, oh. Yeah, all that stuff, right? So my dad says to me, and my dad and Joe uh, get along really well my, and, and, and our friends. And my dad one day calls me, this is about 20 years ago. And he goes, I just hung out with one of the top guys at Club 33 and I pitched Joe <laughs> and I think that I'm going to be able to get him the opportunity to pay to get a Club 33 membership. Wow. I called Joe. Joe's freaking out. Oh my God. He goes and has his like interview or whatever. Joe, and you know, at the time, also Joe, when I met Joe, he was putting himself through law school. 
Yeah. And uh, I was a substitute teacher during the day and, go, and going to law school and playing the vandals at night. My parents just thought that was so cool. Like, oh, finally, Josh got this respectable friend that's going to be a lawyer, <laughs> and a teacher. And so my dad goes, and at the time, I think Joe had a job at CBS television. He was in the legal department at CBS. My dad goes, I went on this whole, you know, full court press about how great Joe is and this and that. I talked about CBS television. I talked about all of his legal work. He goes, the one thing I didn't say is that he plays in a punk rock band called the Vandals. <laughs> yeah. I left that out. But uh, now everyone there thinks it's cool. And cool. If, I go, if Joe makes me a reservation there, which he did, I took my, my, my daughter who turned 13 last week, uh, and we went out last week. I took her to lunch right. there. It was the first time we were having lunch there. And uh, we went and the waiter was like, I've met you before, we got friends with Joe. And I know that, you know, I've been playing the vandals and this and that. And so through Joe, he's been a member for 20 years now. And um, over the years, I'd go once in a while to the, uh, uh, the dining room, like the formal mm -hmm. dining room, which is all they had. Yep. And, and when I say once in a while, I've probably been there like, two times or three times, like over the course of like 15 years. Yeah, but okay. then recently, like within the last five, six, seven years, they opened up, they made the formal dining room a little bit smaller and they've got this big, like nice lounge. It's like this speaking. Yeah, the, the jazz bar. Yeah, the jazz bar. Yeah. yeah. That's the one jazz... with the piano? That's the one yeah. with the piano. Yeah, okay. That thing yeah. slaps, dude. I love the jazz bar. Have you been to the jazz bar? Yeah. One time we have a friend uh, who got us all and sort of rotated us <laughs> uh, through. And yeah, I've been to the jazz bar one time. Phenomenal. If I was a member, I would probably only go there because Tara and I were lucky enough to go to Club 33 before the, the retrofit. Right. Um, it was like a wood paneling and you had the trophy room and it was like, yeah. whoa, this is almost too intense. It was like very old yeah. school 40s LA, right? Yeah. And then now it's pastel and like bone white and gold fringe. <laughs> I'm like, ah, it's not. I would rather sit in the jazz bar. Yeah, it's a little looser there, right? So like uh, when, uh, when the interesting thing too is the jazz bar. Okay, so Joe can make me a reservation and doesn't need to be there. Like he, I said, hey man, can I go next week, Thursday or Friday? He called me back, he goes, how about Thursday at two o'clock? I can get you and your daughter uh, a lunch reservation in the formal dining room. Great. And it's the first time I've been there in like probably 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, he can make a reservation and he doesn't have to be with me. But the jazz bar, you don't need a reservation, but you have to be with a member. So he can't make me a reservation to go hang out in the jazz bar. He's got to be there, but we can show up that afternoon and go, let's go have something to eat and a drink up in the jazz bar. And so we can just show up unannounced, but it's only yeah. for members or you have to be with a member there, but you don't right. have to worry about the reservation stuff. So my kids have been up there ah, two or three times. And, uh, and, but it was the first time that I took any of my kids to the, uh, the, the formal dining room. But it's funny because me growing up thinking about how special it was and having never gone there until I was about 20 years, well, God, yeah, 20 years old or so, mm -hmm. was, uh, just because my dad worked there and just because everyone liked my dad didn't mean that he was going to Club 33 or could, was even allowed to go to Club 33. You know what I mean? It's kind of a weird thing, right? So I grew up there, but I'd never gone there. So I'd always heard the mystery of it. So it's extra special to me when I started going there. My kids are like, yeah, they think it's cool that it's the secret place or whatever. But after a while, they're like, can we just go back and go on the Matterhorn or like it's a restaurant know, to them? Yeah. Well, and I think, the line is for pirates or like, yeah. <laughs> well, I think part of it was because, you know, back then Club 33 before the, the retrofit was sort of like, I don't know why I call it a retrofit. It's a totally like deconstructed and rebuilt kind of thing. But it was like, is there really a secret like thing? You know, you didn't really know. Right. But now it is, oh yeah, Club 3, you know, for sure. And then so I, I could see it sort of like loses some of the mystique about it, which, you know, I think is sort of classically Disney in, in some some ways that they do stuff like that. But uh, that is, um, yeah, it's still cool. I mean, it's still, it's still a fun, still a fun thing. Have you been to the, 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 the club in um, DCA, the 1901 club? I haven't. That place is rad. You should try to, I wonder if Joe can get cool. you in. Cause it's like, I know there's now there's, I, th well, I think there's tiers of club 33 membership. Yes. And so some, you can go over to the 1901 club and it's just like a drinks bar off of Carthay lounge. Carthay. Yeah. Right. Carthay. Yeah. 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 It's yeah cool. have, you said it's cool. Yeah. It's nice. Cause it's, it's low lit. 
you know, it's um, it's more like 30s vibe, if this makes any sense, where it's like the, the chairs feel like either they're leather or like velvet almost. No, they're like super nice leather. Like yeah. it reminded me of like if you were sitting in like the, the Imagineer lounge it, and Walt is sitting next to you and just <laughs> yeah. offered you like a scotch. A scotch like, and four packs of cigarettes. That's like the vibe. <laughs> Where, where and where is it? It's right off of the Carthay Lounge. So if like if you're facing the Carthay Lounge doors, why am I not picturing the Carthay Lounge? It's um in DCA, you know, at the end of Buena Vista Street when you're walking straight down like the the movie theater looking. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Hey. So it's 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 around the right corner of that is the entrance. It's totally nondescript. It's so actually really hard to see. Yeah. Near, no, I've never uh, really uh, never seen it. it. What's that? I've never seen it. I have no <laughs> idea where it is. is it near, like if you make a right, like you're gonna go to the Guardians of the Galaxy. It's around there. Yeah, something. Uh, yeah, something like that. Okay. Yeah, it's it's just it's like there's a nondescript door right off to the right. I think it might even be in the lobby. I sort of forget because you know we 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 were basically club hopping. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the coolest yeah. moment in my entire life at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, check that out. That's I mean that's wild to me because like. You know, I, I was first introduced to the Vandals when I was probably 16, 17. And I, I still say that the three greatest live albums in, in, in music history are uh, uh, the Ramones, uh, Local Live, uh, Yanni, Live at the Acropolis, and Sweat into the Oldies. It's like the classic, uh, it's, the Van, it's the Vandals the Vandals album, is Sweat into yeah. the Oldies, right, where they play it. And yeah. That's oh. when I heard, uh, you know, the, the classic call of Josh Freeze, the Miracle Boy. Like, and yeah. I was like, wow, what is going on here? And then I watched that video, the concert footage. I was like, this is in literal insanity. This, this is just like Warren is insane. Everybody's yeah. insane. Yeah. And um, but it was such a cool vibe. And that was the first Vandals music that I'd ever heard was that live album. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I had listened and I so, you know, I naturally went back and, you know, got a bunch of other songs. And I'm like, or a bunch of other albums. And the 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 pace of the of the albums are so different than the live yeah. albums. I'm like, this is it, it's just they're slower and they're more yeah. I don't know methodical, but like the energy off that album, off that of Sweat to the Oldies, is I was listening to it to today to prepare uh, mentally. Oh, wow. oh, it's funny. such a good. It's just like rips, man. Everything rips, you know. Oh yeah, that was that was fun. That was a fun time. Um, yeah. Do you know? Uh, do you know about the song Power Mustache by the Vandals? It sounds familiar. I'm the yeah. I'm very bad at placing. I, a it's lot of my music came from my friend who would like basically just do mixtapes because I couldn't go out. Like my friend would go to Gilman Street and like go to get to go to shows and my dad hated me. So I didn't get to go. <laughs> so he'd like, you know, get seven inches and record them and whatever. And so I'm, I, I know the songs, but I have no idea what song names are. Well, I have a friend that's a big, big, Disney fanatic, like more than me, more than Joe from the Vandals. He's like, it's, it's, it's almost a disorder kind of thing. Yeah. And, 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 and he knows that he knows the guys in the Vandals and, but he's, and he's not much into punk rock music, but, uh, and he really respects Joe. He knows Joe. And, uh, and we were in my car to go, Hey man, you know about the song power mustache, right? From a record of ours from 1995. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he goes, uh, He's like, no, I don't know that song. I go, you don't know about that verse about Walt Disney? Because this guy's like Mr. Disney trivia guy. Yeah. What do you mean? It was the song is called Power Mustache. I didn't write it. I think Warren wrote it. And the lyrics are really smart and funny. But it's basically about, you know, the first one, the first verse is about all the dictators that had mustaches, all the asshole dictators with mustaches. Uh, there's a, the third verse is about cops and, 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 and people in power and then the police world with, with mustaches. But verse two is about Walt Disney and his <laughs> mustache and not letting any employees have mustaches. And it goes by, it, the lyrics go by so fast. And the fact is, because when I told my friend, he was almost like kind of offended <laughs> because that, uh, that I want to, I want to, uh, t- uh God, I mean, the lyrics are probably pretty easy to pull up on the internet, but I guess there's a book. Uh, I've always just heard about this book and I've never seen it anywhere. I guess I should just Google it. Suppose there's some book called The Dark Prince. Do you know about The Dark Prince? No. There's a book supposedly about Walt Disney called The Dark Prince that's old. I mean, because we wrote this song almost 30 years ago. Okay. 
Can you guys Google and see if yeah, there's it's a Walt Disney print? Hollywood's Dark Prince by Mark Elliott. Okay. Well, the second verse says, "Oh my God, it's so it's so funny." <laughs> it's, it's. I'm gonna try and recite it by memory. Hold on. Okay. I would almost uh, I would almost request you to really as quick as the Dark Prince come up, put in power mustache lyrics. And, yeah. and I'll, I'll let you reset them because uh, they're they're funny. I, I, I've got it here. <laughs> the Dark Prince was a Nazi. His mustache true to form. Instead of arm brand swastikas, mouse ears must be worn. He terminates. I'm doing this by memory. He terminates employees with hair above his lip because in the Fuhrer's kingdom, it's a dictatorship. We should something. We should, should take his frozen corpse. <laughs> his and face and make the Magic Kingdom a truly happy place. Yeah, dude. That's his tongue in cheek, but it's like, you know, this fast period is punk rock song. The Dark Prince is Nazi, his brother is set up. You know, and it's, you know, it's in a way, it's an homage, you know, but but my buddy was almost like, he's like, that's fucked up, man. I'm like, dude, it's a ridiculous song. We're making fun of cops, we're making fun of Stalin and Hitler. We're making fun of Walt Disney. It's like it's just come. It's just we're making fun of mustaches. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's almost like you're just doing irony at some point too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's all. It's yeah. It's comedy. It really is. Yeah. The whole song is comedy. I mean, uh, read the, the lyrics are they're, they're funny. They're good. But uh, anyways, <laughs> that's our. Uh, we have another song. Uh, oh, well, no. that's what I like about about the band of songs. Oh, you have the other song. Uh. uh Pirate, it's like Pirate Ride, pirate I think. Fly. Is that the one you were talking pirate about? Fly. Yeah, it's about going to Disney on acid. Yeah, pirate Slide. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and those are funny lyrics too, because it's literally like, yeah. I'm stuck oh, here I'm now. Like, like, pirate Slide. <laughs> yeah. It says, seven hits of L and nobody can tell. So I spent every dime just to get to Anaheim. Uh, <laughs> I was in the Magic Kingdom. I was in the, the Caribbean. It gets really wicked when you spend an e ticket. I have ventures on the sea, but it's not the life for me. But, but yeah, I, it, it goes on and on. Yeah, Pirate's Life. And in the middle of the song, it breaks down into this, we do a... You know, that whole thing, so. It's good, man. It's good. I heard that today. I was like, oh, yeah, because I read about it. I forgot about it, because it's been... Yeah, I forgot about it until you said it. I was like, you know, I was actually thinking about something else. We have a song called Get In Line, about getting in line and getting on a ride. But it's, it's the mm-hmm. stupidest song ever. And it, nothing, it, it has nothing to do with Disneyland. Well, this is how deep and weird it gets. The only Disneyland reference is in the bridge. It says whatever this goes on and on in the speakers in Spanish when you're waiting for the Matterhorn. Oh <laughs> sure, okay. In Spanish for keep your hands and arms inside the car. Levantense sus manos or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, whatever it says, yeah. the, the the verbatim Matterhorn instructions in Spanish is what's sung in the bridge. That's what I was thinking. I was like, oh, yeah. And then I was like, oh, it's not worth bringing up. And then you go, well, the pirate song. I was like, oh, yeah, there's, yeah, the pirate Bro, it's all worth bringing up because that was like one of my questions later on was like, uh, well, I say later on, um, was, you know, have the parks ever bled over into your music like that? And well, apparently yes. they have. <laughs> well, uh, and I have, uh, real quick, I made a record of one minute songs that came out a couple months ago called Just a Minute. And there's 20 woman, there's 20 60 second songs. And it's volume one, I've got volume two, it's got 21 60 second songs. It's gonna come out this summer. But there's a song on the record called Disneyland is Closed that I wrote at the mm-hmm. beginning uh, of, you know, or a couple months into lockdown. Cause Disneyland, I think my dad said Disneyland shut down like maybe twice ever. Right. Like it was right. The JFK yeah. assassination or something like that. And maybe the day after 9 11. Mm-hmm. Like for yeah. a day. Was, yeah. And then there was this other time years later that a day. So like weeks would go by and months would go by. And I go, Disneyland is empty and closed. It's been seven months. Like, what the hell is happening? This is crazy, man. And uh, that was like a barometer for, for Disney fans, too, where it's oh, like, and another thing, Disneyland is even closed, and that's how you know it's really, really bad. Yeah, I was like, serious. I wrote the song called Disneyland is Closed, and it's got lyrics in it. And uh, 
it's almost like a weird, like, it's so, I would say ballad, but it's not, it's kind of creepy. Should we play it? And it's kind of slow. Sure, can you call it up there? Sure, man. Here we go. God. I never thought I'd see the day that came to be the end. Nowhere in sight, it keeps me up at night. It overturns and spills the thought, gives me the chills. They can't just close the door, can't take it I like that song. It's done. Yeah. Because like, right, because at the break, was it about the 40 minute or 40 second mark where it sort of like builds? It feels like it's going to drop. I mean, about the record, I say, you know, if you don't like the song, by the time you can like lean over and push skip, it's done. So just deal with it. (laughs) Well, I I expected like, you know, the the build up and then some sort of drum thing to happen. Right. But it gets like this weird Mr. Bungle sort of thing. This like distorted voicey thing. And I was like, yeah. I was going for a cross between the good. What I liked about sometimes uh, the artist PJ Harvey is mm-hmm. she would sometimes do these songs where it's not really acoustic. She'd have an electric guitar and it's full distortion as if she's playing with a band, but it's just her singing with a really loud distortion guitar, but no drums kicking in or anything. I always thought that was really cool. So I was trying to kind of, and even the time signature of it, it might be in six. Bev, you know, probably, I'm sure. Anyways, uh, I was kind of, I think the working title before I wrote those lyrics, I think I would, like on my computer would say like PJ Harvey, like even the guitar reminds me of something from her Rid of Me album. And I was trying to kind of a cross of rip off between like uh, PJ Harvey and Ween. Do you know the band Ween? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I have. A, oh, gosh, there is, you yes. could not have brought up that to a better person. I, I, yes. I, I played on a Ween album. I don't know if you knew that or not. No, I, trust but, me, I did. I know everything <laughs> he, about he, you. He knew that. Yeah. And uh, actually have literally wrote in my notes, yeah, you know, I uh, here, this is exactly what I, I wrote. I put, uh, uh, you filled in for Claude on a Ween album, Quebec, which is a great album, underrated album. And I said, I quote, I read that online and literally said, oh my God, into my hands like some insane person. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, oh my God. I <laughs> Ween is is one of the more underrated uh yes for you know, yeah. look, you were on South we was on they were on South Park, so I don't know how underrated that you could be, but like <laughs> yeah, yeah cl- classic like uh you know, uh Mickey is like one of the most underrated guitarists I think there That's is out there. He is great. a phenomenal guitarist. Yeah, yeah, really, really great. And I've been a lifelong fan of theirs. And uh so when he called me when Claude got in that car accident in two thousand two. Yeah. Originally, I was going out there to rehearse. He's like, hey, man, we're going to play some benefit shows to raise some money for Claude, who, of course, had no insurance or something, and he got in this horrible car wreck. Can you come out of the East Coast and play a couple shows with us in New York? I was like, oh, my God, yes, this would be great, right? So I fly out there. I was happy to help. I was happy just to get to play with Wayne. It was really special for me. And, and, and when I was there, he goes, oh, by the way, we're in the middle of making a record. Would you have time while you're out here with us to do some recording? I was like, oh, this, this keeps getting better. We <laughs> know, <laughs> man. So, uh, what song did you play? Oh, and then on my, oh, so real quick, I've got this volume two record that's going to come out this summer called Just a Minute Volume Two. Yeah. And it's got all one minute songs on it. And there's a song on it called uh, Disneyland is Open. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, and what's even funnier is it's an instrumental, so go figure. There's not even lyrics on it. It's called Disney. I had to name it something. I was like, what do you call it? Disneyland's open, but there's also a great song that has lyrics called uh, "called I Got Wasted with the Ween." Oh, geez, and, and not Ween, but the Ween, be, and that's referencing a line from the movie "It's Pat." Remember the movie "It's Pat." Oh, the character from Saturday Night Live, Pat, the androgynous, 
Yeah. Kind of chubby with glasses, Pat, you know? And yeah. Ween's in the movie. Are and, they? Yeah, Ween's in the movie. And at one point, Pat goes, I jammed with the Ween. I jammed <laughs> with the Ween, he says. So, uh, and it worked out. Uh, says. What's that? I said, or she says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or he, or yeah, who knows? Uh, <laughs> they said it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the song, it, it worked out syllable-wise and rhythmically to the way the song was. Sometimes I'll have a song and I'll have a melody worked out and I'm humming things or I'm la 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 things, but I don't have words yet, but I like the way I'm doing uh, just nonsense words. And then you start going, okay, I want to write about this or I want to write about that. I mean, sometimes a song will come up organically where you already have the theme and the title and then you go from there. But lots of times I already have a riff or the music and then I kind of put the words to it. And so I was, I was trying to come up with something. I don't know why I came up with that, but it's, I guess it's a, it's a 60 second song about uh, when I went to, uh, cause I've hung out with them a million times since, and I've worked with them a couple of times since that, that time, the Quebec uh, era. But uh, I flew to uh, Philly and Mickey picked me up. We went to New Hope, Pennsylvania, where they live. And he took me to this, this famous, they've kind of made the bar famous. There's a place called John and Peter's. They play all the time. They're like unannounced. It's a little, it's the only bar in New Hope, Pennsylvania. They, they can walk, you know, Mickey can walk there from his house. And all the time they do gigs. They're just unannounced gigs. They just go and play. Well, we went there that night. We went to John and Peter's. And, and we got, so, I at least got so wasted. And, um, and we went back to the hotel room. <laughs> And I, it's, it's 2002 and it's the last time I ever vomited from drinking alcohol. And the song's about that. I had to change rooms because it was so destroyed. <laughs> oh, man. I honestly, you, man. I, I've probably thrown up three times in the last like 25 years. Like I never throw up, knock on wood, I don't want to throw up anytime soon. I threw up when I was 16 and I threw up like maybe the next time I threw yeah. up, maybe that time. But honestly, I had to... I had to change room. It wasn't like, oh, let me clean this up. It was like the bedspread, the wall, the carpet, the tell, everything was just, I had just covered the room and I had to change rooms. Oh my God. I, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, Life on the road. That's and you weren't so even nice. playing. You were just hanging out. It was, yeah, I was just hanging out. And, and I got so wasted with the ween that <laughs> I had a song about it. It's a cool song too. I like the song. All right, I'll look forward to it. What what song yeah. of Quebec did you play on? I gotta know. Oh, I played on a. Uh, if you remember, I played on Happy Colored Marbles. That's a good song, man. I played on so many people in the neighborhood. Good song too. I played on Chocolate Town. Yep. Okay. And I also played on a song that Greg Graffin, the singer from Bad Religion, who uh, sometimes people you know uh, are like, oh man, like. I don't, I don't think Greg likes a lot of people. <laughs> I'm totally wrong. Same. I, and I'm saying this, I like Greg Graffin a lot, but he's a, he's a tough customer, you know, and he's mm -hmm. a smart guy and doesn't suffer fools lightly. And, uh, and anyways, and he's kind of in a world where there's a lot of fools hanging around backstage. He's a singer bad religion. He's also a professor at Cornell. Right. But, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, so, but he, loves 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 the song transdermal celebration by ween amazing song and i play drums on it so every time i'm anywhere near bad religion whenever i see greg the singer he's like transdermal celebration you fucking play drums on it like he can't get over it he's like i'm a friend for life i mean i've known i've known him for 30 years from running into him but he's like Josh Freeze is special because he plays on my favorite song ever. Look at that one. Like, that he is, loves that song. He no, loves that song. Imagine a bad religion cover of that song. That oh, would be yeah. Yeah. Trans yeah. Transdermal Celebration is like very dreamy and you know, yeah. flowy. And it's just yeah. something ween, man. And you know what? It is you are I I say ween is sort of like the 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 every genre band. And I feel like you're sort of the every genre like plug and play drummer. I mean, you played on a share album. Yeah. Clay Aiken. You know what's really cool? Nine Inch Nails, Guns N' Roses. Like, there's just like the polar opposites of, of, of music. It's if just, you, it's wild. If you offer me a million dollars right now to tell you the name of the share record I played on, I couldn't do it. <laughs> and Clay so, Aiken. 
Yeah, I stopped after about a dozen, after about 25 records, you know, 30 years ago that I played on, I, I realized like the first like three or four albums I played on, I figured because I'm on this CD, oh my God, I recorded this in a real studio. I'd have to listen over and over and play it for all my friends. And then like, there was a couple of them I realized they're not that good. I mean, the like the band that I played on that, that hired me, like maybe the songs weren't that good. Or maybe it's kind of lame, actually. Mm-hmm. And so it got to the point where I was like, okay, when I started playing on dozens and dozens of records, there's a lot of stuff I play on that I'm not interested in, and I and yeah. I don't care about, you know. And it, it's a job, and I'm fortunate. And I'm grateful to have this job, but I, I'm not going to name other names. But there's bands in recent years, in the last five years, that are named bands that I've worked with that I don't own the album, never heard it after I was done with it, and couldn't tell you the name of it if you offered me a ton of money. Now, there's other things that are really, really, really special to me, and I could tell you everything about it. And yeah. Nails files under that, and a perfect circle, and Devo, and the Vandals, and you know, it's like there's tons and tons of stuff that I work on in Paul Westerberg that I love, uh, you know, tremendously. And I feel like I can talk about that okay, because I'll also tell you, yeah, and there's a bunch of stuff that is not that good, and I'm not really proud of my drums, and I think it's just like kind of like generic sludge. I so, think- you know, I mean, if I did, if everything I did is, oh man, this is awesome and this is great and I played so good here. No, there's lots of stuff. I don't, not only is the band not good, but my drumming, I just go, ah, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> so, and I said about the Vandal songs, there's lots of Vandals, there's some, plenty of bad Vandal songs that I'm not interested in hearing again after we recorded them. And yeah. then there's some incredible Vandal songs that I think are so great and so smart and funny and clever that, uh, you know, I feel like just I can be honest about it instead of going also not taking the uh, angle of ah oh, shucks you know that you know no that wasn't really good yeah, you think it was good? kind you know, of thing like, yeah. yeah if I think it's good I'll tell you and I'll also say about all the crap I did too you know yeah well because you do a lot of session work and that's how you're on all these albums people yeah. call you hey I need a drummer for this or I need to do this when you get those calls are you in the studio with those bands or is it like remote work where you just got you need to lay this track down and then you ship it. All the above. Okay. Like I, I, when you and when you say I, I played on a share album, I actually played on th- I think a share song that was on one of her albums. Like I didn't do the whole album. Okay. Right. I, okay. I played yeah. on a song and I never met her. I think I may have played on a couple Clay Aiken songs. Never met him. I've played on uh, select tracks on multiple Kelly Clarkson albums. Never met her. Um, it's pretty crazy. There's a lot that of people. Like that. Is that like a weird thing to sort of? I don't know, you've never met your a boss? It, I don't know, like the person it, who's hiring you. In those situations, like a Kelly Clarkson record, if I'm being hired to play in three or four songs and she's not around, I feel like because it's only going to take me an afternoon to do it, mm-hmm. I feel like she's not really my boss. My boss for the day is the producer. Okay. She's trusting enough to finish these tracks and redo the drums in LA while she's off doing whatever she's doing. And so... I treat the producer that day, usually somebody that I know as my boss. What do you need me to do? How do we do this better? Let's make this work right. But unless the artist is there and they've got input to it, you know, which that happens most of the time is that way. You know, it's not, it's not like it happens a lot where the artist isn't there, but I have done so many hundreds and hundreds of sessions uh, that uh, yeah, there's been plenty of times where the artist isn't, there. you know, I mean, I've told the story recently to somebody I might've even done online, but a funny one is Melissa Etheridge. Uh, I was on a plane a couple of years ago. And before I got on the plane, this guy came up to me and he recognized me. He was a drummer and uh, he introduced himself. And I said, Oh, cool. What are you doing? He goes, Oh, I'm flying to, sh- I think we're on the same plane. Uh, I play drums with Melissa Etheridge and we're going to Chicago to do this thing. He said, Oh, great. So we talk, small talk for a while. I get on the plane as I get on the plan, I go, I see Melissa Etheridge sitting in row three or something. Uh, I go back to my seat in row 300. And uh, <laughs> after, at the end of the flight, I'm getting off the plane and I get off and I see her standing there and there's the guy that introduced himself to me. And, I, and as I walk up, Melissa Etheridge comes up to me and she goes, hey, Josh, uh, I want to say hi, uh, I'm Melissa Etheridge. I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I know who you are. <laughs> And she goes, I want to thank you. For, I want to thank you for playing on my album. And I went, oh, yeah. 
oh yeah that was cool and i'm thinking <laughs> what is she talking about yeah. <laughs> I, I played on melissa ethridge album yeah. and uh, i go yeah I, I played it off like you know like a true bullshit right? yeah right yeah like, yeah that was awesome yeah those tracks were great blah, blah 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 and then we i walk away and i'm like oh my god i played on two songs for her but not, she wasn't there and I was doing a different session for a friend of mine, a producer up in Seattle. We were working on this band's record and at the end of the day, it was like post dinner and he said, how much energy do you have? I said, why? He goes, I've got, I'm finishing some songs from Melissa Etheridge. There's two songs, the drums are just not happening. I want to fix them. I mean, I can pay you whatever you want. And I, are you up to it? You know, we'll be done by 10 o'clock or something. I go, sure. I whip out these two songs, bam. Two hours later, I, I for, three days later, I forgot that it even happened, right? right. So, and th th so when she said that, I'm going, okay, there's, there's little baby artists that I can understand forgetting that I worked with them because it's a band that I never heard of them before and I never heard about them after, you know? But I'm going, Melissa Ather is like a like multi-Grammy award-winning artist. I must have worked with a lot of people if I could forget about that credit. <laughs> or I'll be making lists of like a discography for something and I'll go, okay, they're asking for like kind of grassroots Americana rock. I can't think of any other records like that. Oh, Bruce Springsteen, I guess. Like, <laughs> like how do you forget about Bruce Springsteen? You know, like. The boss, baby, you can't. Oh, another good example. I worked on, I don't know, like two or three songs for him, never met. Never met him. And I was rehearsing with Sting a couple of years ago in New York and we're playing and in walks Bruce Springsteen to the room, talks with Sting for a minute in between songs and then leaves. I was like, oh, I was almost going to introduce him and go, hey, I played on your last record. I <laughs> Whatever. Not a big deal. And if I was younger, maybe I'd be like, oh man, I could have met Bruce Springsteen. I'm so pumped. It's like, after you do it for a long time, it's all like, you know. They're just people, I guess. You get less, yeah, and you get less and less starstruck. Unless it's someone that you really, I once again, I respect Bruce Springsteen, but I didn't grow up with Bruce Springsteen posters on my wall. So I'm, yeah, I've the, plenty of famous people, you know what I mean? And so unless it's someone that I really resonate with or I really look up to, it's not going to phase me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Is there a band that you want to work with that you haven't worked with yet? Yeah, I mean, th there is. There's a handful of them. But for instance, they're all weird kind of, uh, two of them are, are bands that will, that not only did one guy die recently, so I won't be working with him, but, uh, well, for instance, okay, let's take Prince, for instance, right? Oh. I'm a big Prince fan. My God. But I think that, uh, I think if Prince was alive right now, if I was 22 and he called me to play drums with them, I would jump at the chance. But if he was alive and called me tonight and wanted me to come play drums with him, I don't think I would because I know I don't need, at this point in my career, I don't need to get yelled at by Prince. And <laughs> I've, heard he's, I've heard he was difficult to work for. And I know yeah. a lot of people that worked for him. Mm -hmm. I know people that have played in his band. I know people that have worked at his studio in Minneapolis. I'm like, you know what, man, I'm an adult. And what I needed as a stepping stone to get more gigs. I don't, I don't need a break. You know what I mean? Yep. Right. Do I love Prince and respect Prince and think he was a genius? Yeah, absolutely. And it would be cool to work with him. And then eh, maybe not, you know, meaning it's like, I don't need to be uh, berated by it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to put myself in that position. I'd rather stay a Prince fan. Um, sure. Another one, this is way different, way different than most of the stuff I do, but I'm a, uh, I used to call myself a closet Steely Dan fan, but now I'm, I'm uh, comfortable enough in my own skin to come out as a Steely Dan fan and be- you go, uh, welcome. Welcome. Yeah. And, um, and uh, same thing. I was always like, I was like, man, you know, I love to work with Steely Dan. I work with uh, Walter Becker, unfortunately, he died a couple of years ago. And, and but uh, I think those guys would be tough to work for. And I think that they seem, and what I like about them is they're kind of curmudgeons and kind of like grumpy and not into it, you know? And that's you know, like, that's part of the attraction for me to them. But it's like, yeah, I don't need Donald Fagan to give me shit. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, don't, you know, I don't. I, and I don't need him to help me get another gig. Um, mm -hmm. Some bands that I really like that it'd be fun to play with. Uh, a funny example, well, one is uh, like, I'm, I'm a 
longtime Pixies fan, oh. and uh, I love the Pixies, and yeah. and I'm friends with the Pixies. Oh, but man. it's like, but David's the drummer, and he's always been the drummer. He's a great drummer, but the only time that would happen is I think you know, if David broke both of his legs in a car accident or something, you know, or, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. If something, I think if something bad happened where they had to finish something out or in the middle of something and David was not able to play, um, you know, it's funny, he'd probably hate hearing me say this too, because like, uh, I don't know him that well. Mm -hmm. I, I know Joey and, and Charles, Black Francis, Mm -hmm. and my old friend pause is I, I got her the job playing bass you know now that kim deal's not the band anymore but it's like i'm always looking from around i uh <laughs> i always feel like david like is looking at me like oh god josh freeze is here and i always feel like he thinks that i'm like coming to try and steal this gig i'm like you're you're I'm the like, vulture this, like, this, is, this is your band man i'm not you don't have to sweat me you know like it's all you know but it's kid, funny yeah. he's like i don't he's the one i know the least and it's almost like, like oh hey hey josh and then he'll like split it out the dressing room like it's awkward or something I'm like <laughs> I, I i like him I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan and i i love his drumming on those records and uh it would only be a situation where they were you know between a rock and a hard place for me to do that but that's the kind of like and that's what the like the ween thing was like claude you know got badly hurt they needed help on something i was like i felt like i had won some like mtv contest like be in ween for a week you know i, like, I could be in ween for a week and then go back to my you know but i mean two of my favorite bands in the world are devo and the replacements so the fact that i've gotten to work with devo and paul westerberg and the replacements for years and not only gotten to know my heroes but like work with them and you know know them well enough that the phone could ring and be one of them. I send it a voicemail because we're talking. <laughs> but if it was 25 years ago, I'm like, holy shit, I got, you know, like, yeah. and it becomes normal. They become like your kind of band members or your peers after a while, you know? So yeah. I feel really fortunate about that. I, uh, I actually have to go pretty soon. Yes. Okay. All right. So I can talk and talk and talk. And talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to wrap it up, but, uh, um, um so fun. yeah. And you know, and then I'm like, well, I asked this question, it's going to be another 10 minutes and poor Josh is probably just gonna be like, his brains are going to yeah. be out of his head. <laughs> you saw my energy. Um, how long do I have? Five minutes? Sure. Okay. Let's five just, minutes. Do some rapid fire questions and I'll, I'll not do long winded answers. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, one was really a comment, like, you know, watching your dad's uh, video clips back to your dad for a second. I, I got like severe Rolly Crump vibes. I don't know if you ever met Rolly Crump or seen oh, interviews. I know him. who he is, but I never met him. Like colored glasses. He was on our show and I totally bombed the interview. It sucked so bad. <laughs> um, it was awful. But uh, but he just he reminded me of of uh, your dad reminded me of like Rolly Crump in in sort of the the look like the colored glasses and you know the kind of yeah. you know, hair, but in in sort of the the vibe. And I read an, an interview that you and uh, and your brother Jason and and your dad gave, um, and you guys were sort of bantering back and forth. And it's that same kind of like chilled out vibe of yeah this thing was really cool like he's talking you know this is like a year ago and he's like yeah and i thought that was really cool and so i thought yeah that'd be rad to do that or whatever and he's just it's not like i guess i don't really know where i'm going with it but roly seemed like he lived that sort of lifestyle of i'm talented but i'm not going to be a dick about it and i'm just going to like enjoy my talent and kind of yeah, just... pretty, pretty casual about it right yes thank you be real casual about it and I, I i get the same sort of vibe from you too and that's you know is that sort of a, a key to success, I guess, in this sort of entertainment business is to not be too full of yourself, I would imagine. I mean, I think, yeah, I think in any line of business or life in general, you're going to turn people off by, by being an arrogant prick. You yeah. know what I mean? And there's, <laughs> yeah, well. there's, they are out there. And so it's like to, uh, I don't think like I'm an arrogant prick <laughs> at art and I'm really trying to not be. You know what I mean? I guess I'm lucky that I'm not, or I don't think that I am. And and uh, and I sometimes will go out of my way uh, in situations where I know if someone has dealt with jerks or people that are really, really full of themselves, I like to pride myself on, and I'm confident, I guess you can walk that line and want to be confident, but not too cocky. Yeah. I mean, you got to be confident, but not, not an arrogant, you know, a, aloof uh, mm -hmm. prima yeah. donna, right? Yeah. Well, watching videos of you play, um, you you always have a smile on your face. 
And I think that that is really important for for, you know, musicians. I, you know, a lot of people have like rock and roll face, you know, especially guitarists because they're on the front or whatever. But like you're smiling all the time. Um, the drummer from Dave Matthews bands the same way, just constantly like big, just smiling. You're clearly obviously loving what you do. And I don't feel like you can be sort of mean and then get on stage and, you know, you're not doing it for the crowd. You're really, you really enjoy what you're doing. I mean, you've yeah. been doing it for, I don't know, a hundred thousand years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Usually I'm smiling because I'm going, man, I'm making so much money tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, punk rock is, uh, is <laughs> the, 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 the money making track that you want to do. Absolutely. I'm making as much money as the guy from Dave Matthews band. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah that's uh that's probably true all right i have a, a couple questions from the chat what's that oh. oh sorry i thought you said okay um i had a question from the chat um if you could compose or record an alternate soundtrack for a ride at disneyland which one would you pick Jeez. oh boy mm. oh boy yeah, oh, that's, that's from Pizza Pat. Oh, you know what? I was about to say something like, you know, Haunted Mansion, but like I, I couldn't do it justice. Like stuff like the Haunted Mansion, like the the music's already so good, and I don't pride myself on someone that could write kind of uh, gloomy, scary music. You know, yeah, right? Uh, the, the, I went straight from stuff like that to like, oh, okay, like how about like you know. I think I, 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 I'd take a good shot at uh, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. <laughs> oh, okay. I like that answer. I would have thought Space Mountain, because I, but maybe that's too obvious. I think it's too it's obvious. Already like, da, 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 da. The, tiki room, the Tiki Room's already complete perfection. You can't fuck with the Tiki Room. Um, no, you can't do that. But you know, oh, uh, no. uh, oh man, I just had someone on the tip of my tongue. I was going to say, uh, Mr. Toes. Oh, no, I've been working a lot over the last uh, year and a half with Danny Elfman and oh. played drums on his latest record that came out. I love Danny Elfman. We've been trying to get him on this show. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would split my skull open. I, 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 don't, I would just go, hi, I would click to admit, hi, Mr. Elfman, watch me, watch, look at my skull. Yeah. I, I don't know what yeah. I would do. Let's, let's call him on speakerphone right now. Oh, my God. <laughs> But he, I think he's, he's not mad at me, but he's sad at me, and so am I, because I'm not able to, I'm being serious, I, I, I had to literally, I've been in denial for like the last month, but they asked me to, and I so badly want to, and I was supposed to a couple years ago, but then it got shut down. Anyways, long story longer, yep. I had to tell this manager about 48 hours ago that I said, there's just no way, I'm out of town, there's no way I can do it, but I had to tell them that I cannot join him this year at Coachella to be his drummer. Oh. He oh. shows at Coachella. And that was, I didn't want to say those words. So like he would text me, his manager would text me, hey, how's April looking? I'd be like, oh, I'm just trying to get one more. I'm just trying to figure something out. I'm trying to see if maybe there's a chance to, and, I, and finally, like his manager's like, I looked online, I saw you've got dates like with Sting and dates with The Offspring and you're out of the country in April. Should we be looking for somebody else? And I said, I hate to say it. I didn't want to say it, but right. I, can't, I can't do it. Oh, you know? man. Anyways, my point is when I was working with when I started working with him on this record that came out recently, we talked about Disneyland at some point, and he goes, you know, I did music for, uh, there's a ride at, uh, at the Hong Kong at my oh. favorite Disney park. Yeah. Uh, their version of the Haunted Mansion is this thing called... Uh, the Phantom not, Manor, I think is what it is. Phantom Manor is... Uh, I there. think in uh, Paris. No. They have a weird thing. Uh, uh, what's the name? I yeah, should know this. One. This is my it's job. Weird because they don't believe they don't believe in ghosts over there. So ghosts aren't scary. So it's more like this mysterious, funny Mystic Manor. Mystic Manor. Mystic Manor. Mystic Manor. Good job. So Mystic Manor, Danny did all the music for. Her. And he goes, Oh, I had to wow. fly to Hong Kong. And I had to ride the ride about 700 times. We go through things and, I, and we'd have to come back and take notes. And I'd have to say, you know, the transition from the one room when the carts turn around and you see that thing, that's when the strings really need to come up audio wise. And that's the big moment. And then they'd ride it again. And then they'd ride it again. And, go, and I think it's so cool that he did uh, all the original music. That is, for that is cool. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, I, 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 you know, spent my formative teen years singing to the uh, Night Before Christmas soundtrack on my breaks <laughs> at Thrifty Ice Cream. Yeah, just go. classic. I mean, uh, yeah. Is he as insane in person as he as he looks like on Instagram? <laughs> like in a good way, like a super like I'm too creative to even like this thing. I can do this movie and then still have eight other projects. Of course, sort of like a David Lynch seems like a little like too creatively crazy. Yeah, I mean, the thing about guys like, you know, the time I was spent with guys like Danny Elfman or Trent Reznor, uh, it's like they, they people, there's, they're, you know, they didn't get there by accident, you know, and mm -hmm. they're so smart and they're so focused and hardworking that, yeah, he can be funny or wacky, but it's not like he's this weird guy. It's like he's, <laughs> he's a super cool guy. Yeah, you know he's got a bunch Very of artwork in his studio. He's got, he's got weird. Sh he likes weird shit and stuff, but it's like he's really cool and easy to talk to and easy to work with, and you know. God yeah, bless him. Man. Yeah, he's, he's a, a pleasure and definitely not like oh god that was weird. You know, I mean, when I hang out, I don't. <laughs> no, then, oh, yeah, I was sort of being uh, outrageous for a second, but yeah, it's. I mean, he. Yeah, he, I get it. I get it because all the time people go. Oh man, what's Trent like? What's Maynard like? You know, I used to have that band of Perfect Circle with Maynard, James, yeah. and every. Oh, yeah, is he really weird? I'm like, well, yeah, artistically, performative, maybe, but also, yeah. We went to the mall yesterday and spent an hour at Best Buy. <laughs> well, it's not that weird, you know what I mean? Sure. We watched Dumb and Dumber on the tour bus for the. <laughs> you know? It is so weird to like to to meet you know to 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 know people who either are your heroes like you're talking about Devo or people who know your heroes so you can ask these questions and you're like, I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. They're just, they're just the people at the end of the yeah. day. Like I'm, I hope you were calmed uh, Josh by talking to me. I'm just a person. <laughs> I, no. I, you know. I get it. Yeah. Um, I do have a, like several other questions, but I'm, I I want to let you go, but I do have these, these guest questions that I ask. It's sort of like inside the actor studio that I totally ripped off, um, but made okay. a Disney. So two okay. minutes left. You got okay. it. All right. Um, what's your favorite Disney attraction? The same people that I was with today asked me that, and it's such a hard answer, man. Yeah. I will say there's something, it's definitely not a uh, roller coaster, and it's not, it's a small world. It's, it's something like, it's either, I mean, I, I, that's a tough question. I will say there's something really special and cool, and I feel like you can't go to Disneyland or unless the unless the crowds are just off the chain and saying that day. Um, I feel like you can't go to Disneyland without going on the Haunted Mansion of Pirates of the Caribbean. Like that to me, that Thank little you. those two go hand in hand. Just such classic, great Disneyland attractions. Right? They're the same. They should actually. They yeah, should put the people or the uh, the ghost the doom buggy into the ride for pirates. Yeah. I mean, it is, yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, sorry, I keep on thinking that I'm hearing my wife and or kids coming out. That's right. Um, those two, and there's something really special to me about Fantasyland. You know, the yeah. Peter Pan and Mr. Toes and that stuff. You know, I love the Tiki Room. I like, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the roller coasters are great, but whatever. Um, What's your least favorite? Oh, God. Least favorite? Yeah, we're getting into the, the yin and yang of, <laughs> I don't know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, an overrated one for me is Autopia. Yes. Whatever. I was just going to say, if you need help, I can give you a suggestion. <laughs> Autopia is cool when you're five and you're like, I think I'm driving a car. <laughs> and I, you know, whatever. The line's yeah, long, the ride's long. And then to, to get out of the car's long, it's literally just a traffic ride. It's a yeah, traffic ride. Yeah. I'm not a fan of the Nemo ride, but I used to like the submarines. Submarines? Yeah, I agreed. Oh, submarines are a cool conveyance. Um, what old ride should they bring back to the parks? Oh, God. Yeah, I loved Adventures Through Inner Space. And that's, that was your era, too, of, of being in Tomorrowland. Oh, so cool. Um, that was great. And I also... Uh, America Sings. You ever go to America yep. Sings? You know, nope. that, 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 was so, that was really, really, I spent my whole childhood going to America Sings. It was so cool. America Sings, Adventures Through Inner Space. The, oh, I had this conversation with my friend that's a security guard there the other day. The, the people mover. 
People Who's, mover. Well, the people mover. Number I yes. I wish it could come back. When um, I was a little guy, for sure. Was that? I've only ridden it at Disney World. Oh yeah, the people mover, and it's like the Rule. track that goes around almost the whole park. It's been sitting there for like 15 years. I mean, I, I'm, now I'm coming up with all these things that I used to do as a kid. It's not there. The sky buckets have been gone for years. I used to yeah. go those all the time. I used to love those. But um, uh, I was telling my kids the other day, what was cool, they've heard me probably tell it a hundred times, but Star Tours, uh, what was cool is I was working out at Disneyland when Star Tours opened and they used to, back then too, there was like, you know, during the week they would close at like 6 p.m., number one. Mm-hmm. Done at six, like Monday through Thursday or something. And then, uh, and also there was a time for a while that was closed uh, either on Mondays or on Tuesdays. There was a time when it was closed like a day a week, I think, you know, yeah. but we would go, uh, they'd let all the employees do test rides on it. So like my band would get done playing and they'd be closing and we'd get to go over and ride star tours and be like, the on star nice. tours. that's rad, dude. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. cool. Uh, last question. If you could travel back in time and meet Walt Disney, what would you say to him? Oh, God. Jeez. Uh, uh, you know, it's funny. <laughs> when you put on the spot, like, there were certain questions that I feel like such a dumbass not being able to come up with something. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. That's the yeah. point of these questions. They're spotlight questions. They're like... I'm going to say... <laughs> How bad did you rip off that one artist guy of yours with the Mickey Mouse character? <laughs> <laughs> was it really his or was that yours? Or that's you a good him a answer. Residual? Come on. That's a good answer because most people say, uh, stop smoking. <laughs> oh, you just stop smoking? Yeah, and I'm like. No, you know the question I asked him, I said, dude, let me come up to the the apartment upstairs. and Let's let party, Walt. I mean. Have a couple drinks. And make me a drink. Yeah, yes, make let's me have a drink. drink up in the, you know. Let's hang. Yeah, let's hang, man. Uh, all right, everybody. You guys can go to thejoshfreeze.com. That's F-R-E-E-S-E and order his new album right now on pink vinyl, actually, by the way, which sounds pretty rad. Vinyl, the artwork yeah. is worth the price of admission. <laughs> Absolutely. Nice. Just a Minute, Volume 1. Uh, is a new project from Josh. It's a solo project, and uh, it slaps pretty good. It's it's definitely um, it definitely moves around a lot. Um, yeah. So it's not just like uh, oh, it's just a punk rock album. It's it's really not. It's it's much more than that. So cool. check it so out. Once again, the song is only a minute long. So if you don't like it, it's going to be over real quick. That's right. <laughs> uh, also, a bunch of stuff on Spotify. Um, so you can go uh, follow Josh on Spotify and 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 do that stuff too. But buy the albums. Buy these. Buy these albums, please. Don't just stream everything. Buy it. I would say buy the album. Not, I'm not going to get rich off of it at all, but I just don't want to be totally embarrassed every time I talk to my friend that put the album out for me. I don't want to have him go, well, you sold 210 copies, I guess. <laughs> I just want to sell the thousand copies that we made and then I'll be fine. I don't care about any of it after that. <laughs> Uh, Josh, thanks, dude. I I will let you go. Um, I appreciate you staying late and uh, taking oh, the guys. Class. It was a lot of fun, man. Cool, guys. I had a, I had a good time. Thanks, man. Thanks. I will see you. I I guess I hit that leave button, don't I? Yeah. (laughs) Signing off. All right. Later, brother. Have a good one. Bye, guys. Bye. Wow. (sighs) Man. That was that was incredible. I got to like no questions. You didn't need to. Which is cool. Like I'm okay with it. Like because because and I, I here let's take a we're gonna take a break we're gonna take a quick break I need to go to the restroom I want to get something to drink or we'll finish up and you know I need to take a break so uh hang on and um I guess we'll debrief yes I don't okay. know. um <laughs> hang on everybody it's uh ears up uh we'll be I don't know whatever yeah all right yeah breaky breaky poo time I loved all his name dropping I've oh got, my like, gosh. He was so, he's just like, <laughs> he's so casual about it. Cause like, they're just people in his life. I was reading his Wikipedia page, which I had read already, but then I like wanted just to refresh myself and dude's been on like 400 albums. Yeah. It, it's, it's insane. I was, I was texting my dad and I, <laughs> uncle sting. I died. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you had to text my dad about Devo because I was like, my dad's Devo. And I was like, 
I forgot to tell him that it's just it, it's crazy. And then when he mentioned Ween, I was like, did Jason know this? <laughs> I'm sure he knew, but I was like, oh, this has to, I hope this gets brought up. Yeah, that was just uh, crazy. That guy, that guy was very cool. I had a couple of questions, but there was never like a time. Like <laughs> he just kept talking and I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna listen. Uh, yeah, well, and it's funny because it really did tie into Disneyland a lot more than I even expected. Yeah, and I mean, I guess I kind of, um, so like we on the BN, I think, I, I tend to block those interviews out, but we interviewed Maxwell Plant. That's not his name, but it's Robert Plant's son. Yes, I remember that. And yeah. I remember him like specifically like he didn't want to talk about his dad yeah which like, is awkward and we were like well then <laughs> you're you're his son and you own a brewery okay. interview's over yeah bye <laughs> yeah no he was he was very cool and like the selfish part of me was like can you like set us up with all these people like we want to interview your dad we want to interview tony um, baxter i wanted Ed elfman I was really hoping. I think I blew that when I said, oh, "Is he weird?" Um, I would love to interview Danny Elfman. You, f I'm gonna cut it. You can f are you fucking kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? He dropped Danny a couple Elfman? F's in there too. So, well, I know, what and I got to. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I would literally. I mean, I've I've had daydreams about just driving to Danny Elfman's office. Like when I emailed him, let's just talk about it on this stupid show. Hold on a second. Okay. Um, intro, uh, there we go. All right, here we go. Gee, sorry guys, but that guy bought 14 churros. I'm all sold out. And now back to the show. Oh boy. Let me tell you guys. Um, what a fun interview. What a fun interview, right? Jeez. You still kind of feel like you want to throw up, don't you? Uh, you know, a little bit. But once he started, like, running, like, once he started just going. Um, you didn't have to do anything. I didn't really have to do. <laughs> well, I had to do more. I had to do, I had to do it differently. Mm. Because what I had to do is take, like, the spider web that he was, like, weaving <laughs> and try to, like, piece it together to, to fit my notes. And it's not for anything that he was doing, but, like. That's what throws me a lot in interviews where I have like timelines and then it doesn't go anywhere. And I go, but I, I'm doing it wrong because what's happening isn't matching the way I thought it was. Going. And it's, it's a thing I'm working on. Um, and he was great at, at just going all over the place, but it was very conversational. Yeah. Yeah. And I liked it and it, it felt, it felt just more friendly than it did like an interview. Um, but yeah. I had a lot of stuff about like the Disneyland band. Um, I asked, you know, questions like of Dave from Dave Land Web. And he's like, yeah. you can ask these couple questions. I'm curious about this. I never got to it. No. Sort of feel bad, but whatever. Um, yeah. So we're talking before the break. Yeah, there were some, there were some swears and, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to tell the man, uh, Hey, can you, please, can you not? <laughs> that okay. would be so uncool. Yeah. I mean, and I, I don't, I mean, maybe I'll beep a couple out, but maybe I'll just leave them in. I don't know because I, I the show is having, can you do like a disclaimer at the beginning? Yeah. Like that's all I would do. This 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 show has a little more adult language than our shows typically have. And yeah. maybe bleep out the f the f bombs. The effers, yeah, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. There are only three. <laughs> oh, best counting. Look at I you. Did. I was like, oh, there's two. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, at the break we were talking about getting Danny Elfman, and it's like I've had daydreams of you know when we were when we were actively trying to pursue him, and I was like emailing him. I'm like, I will co we'll come to his office, set it up. And I had like visions about what his office would be like. <laughs> and it's exactly like what Josh said. Like, oh, there's like weird art on the wall, whatever. And I'm like, oh, I just I feel like Jeremy now. <laughs> <sighs> <clears throat> yeah, that would be, that would be like, amazing, but it, you know, it's not. I also, I, I'm not going to say that he wasn't truthful, but I feel like you know, he's a musician. And so I think he might be a little, um, he's a musician who, a successful musician who hangs out with other successful musicians. So I think that maybe he's a little dulled to certain eccentricities. 
Mm-hmm. Like his- I feel like Danny Elfman is going to be an eccentric dude. I don't think he's going to be weird. I don't think he's going to be crazy, but I think you're going to be like, well, that was, that <laughs> yeah. was Danny Elfman. And I think that's what he was sort of saying. I think you're right, but I think he was also sort of saying that, like, you know, they're out there, but... Um, but they're also just like us. They're also just, just like us, yeah. And, I mean, his his example is like Trent Reznor. I wouldn't consider Trent Reznor, like, super weird because, for me, seeing that is, like, performative, right? Where, you know, not from Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails, it's like you're on stage, you're doing this weird stuff, blah, blah, blah. But Danny Elfman's, like, not really on screen. I think he's just a weird... I mean, he has, like, a... It's a, actually a, a solo punk record, I think, he came out over quarantine, which is what Josh was alluding to. Uh, and I meant to pick it up, and I haven't done that. I should, I should listen to that. So Danny Elfman and um, Nightmare Before Christmas guy. No, wait, that, that's the Corpse Bride guy. Tim Burton. I feel like they're... Well, yeah, they work together. I mean, they work together, and I feel like they both have a certain, almost like they're engi- like engineer brains. Yeah. You know, what I've heard about Tim Burton is that like, he doesn't really finish his sentences. Like he's a little quirky where he'll just trail off because he's so like looking at lights. I don't know, whatever. Right. But um, yeah. Anyway, I, look, we can get Danny Elfman out of that. I would love to have Josh back on the show, but, and so I told, I told this PR I'm lady, to lunch. <laughs> I, know, I would, <laughs> bro, I would love to hang out with Josh. And in fact, he did a, um, and I wanted to get to this too. He did. Uh, he had a, a solo album a couple of years back, um, where it was, you know, it's seven bucks for the album, but there's packages. It was almost like a, a Patreon or like a GoFundMe thing type of thing, but it wasn't. It was just like on the website where one of the packages was like, um, "I'll come to my house, meet me, and then drive away in my Volvo station wagon, and you can have my car." Yeah. Or like, uh, like one package was like 75 grand and it was like, we'll go out and we'll record. I'll write four songs for you and I'll put them on YouTube and I'll do this. And we'll, but, but one of those packages was like, hang out with me at Disneyland. Oh, geez. And I, I wanted to ask about that and see how, like, but we just, we never, we never got there. Cause I want to know if I think he actually did it. And one of those videos is on line. And the guy who won just <laughs> looks like no fun at all. No offense. He just looked like, I don't know what's going on right now. Because Wait, this was Josh? <laughs> yeah, Josh did Oh, this. wow. Because I sort of feel like, you know, not that he didn't look like no fun. I don't mean to say that. But um, it just, you know, I feel like Josh's personality is up here. And I feel like this kid was like, I don't, this is, <laughs> this is a lot of attention right now. I really thought this was going to yeah. be something else. <laughs> For wow. sure. Um, but that would be so cool because Josh has a ton of stories about Disneyland. There, I read one um, where like his brother ate too many Red Hots, like in Critter Country, they started vomiting. Oh no! And huh. when you the thing about Red Hots, the thing that is in the name is that they're red, and so he starts oh, throwing no. up blood, like a stream of red, and oh. people are like calling the paramedics, like everybody's freaking out, and then Josh has to be like, no, no, it's just too many Red Hots. It's not blood. It's fun. <laughs> Oh Fine. man. I think stories like that are really funny. But anyway, um, I told his uh the, the PR lady who hooked us up, it's like, yeah, we'll probably be like half an hour. <laughs> yeah. So but she probably knew better. I mean, she knows him. She yeah, knows him. Yes. yeah, that was what that was that would be two questions. That would be, that would be the, I don't even think intro. one. I think I looked, I think it was like 24 minutes before I asked the question. <laughs> and he and you asked a question because he allowed you to. <laughs> yeah, which <laughs> be honest with you he's absolutely right it's It's way better than someone who doesn't talk because i've absolutely bev and knows for sure i've had those interviews 100 (laughs) percent. they're very hard and i would i know it's going to be a good one when you send me a just an audio clip and it's four seconds of silence and i'm like (laughs) oh yeah um i much prefer a chatty kathy talks yes because i do i get to enjoy it listening to it as well yeah yeah, you're not. You don't have to think about the next thing you're gonna say. Yeah. <clears throat> some random questions. Oh, but he, it, that was great. I mean, honestly, like of even even like I loved our Raleigh Crump interview, but mm-hmm. I will say that this was you. You should go back and listen to it. I it I, was I, not I, I did. I had bad. to edit it. It was terrible. I, I put my head through a wall four hundred times while editing that show. I was so bad. Anyway, go ahead. Anyway, 
Um, enough about you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Never. <laughs> that uh, it, I was so just I couldn't stop listening to him. Like he, his stories were. He talked a lot, but they were really good stories. Yeah, like he's, they, a, he's, he's a he's a good storyteller. He didn't ramble. There was always a point that he was trying to make, and he, you know, he was always getting to something, and then he would get to it, and then all of a sudden he'd be over here. <laughs> well, and then he could <laughs> bring it another point. Around. He could bring it back around and finish up his thought in the first place. He can keep track of it. Yeah. A lot of people who ramble can't. Yeah, I so, can't. <laughs> yeah, I just you're like, what was I? I don't really know, but I mean, that's the drummer. He's just like. I'm on. I got to go. I got to yeah. keep track of what's going on, man. But for me, that was like our most enjoyable interview. I loved it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I was looking at like some of the bands he, that were playing on the Tomorrowland Terrace, which in case you guys don't know, it, it's it's now where like the Jedi Training Academy is. Um, and it used to be a little more like Rolly Crump, like Rolly Crump designed the the backdrop for the Tomorrowland Terrace. And um, they took it away and they added some back. But anyway, they, they were, you know, have, have a lot of bands in the 70s. There was a band... Um, called your kind of people oh yeah well, that's nice which sounds very 70s band uh they had one album recorded live at the los angeles marriott hotel that sounds of a people. little racist <laughs> your kind of well maybe uh, <laughs> the other one i found was called tabasco mm, a okay. band called tabasco cool. and then i ran across a blog deep on the web somewhere where someone found out Tabasco is literally the name of the font that they used for the the band name. So sure. it's like it's like us making a band called like Ariel Sands <laughs> using the Ariel Sands font. Like the the That's font really is funny. literally called Tabasco, and it's the font of the name. It's just like, weird. <laughs> it's also one of those like lost in translation packages, you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah, but um, yeah, I don't know. It was good stuff. Apparently, uh, Polo, that band that he was in, actually. On Josh's Etsy page, where you can get through from his website, you can buy an un, an unopened copy of the Polo vinyl. They had one record out. Oh wow! One hundred twenty five bucks, which I feel like is sort of a deal. Um, That's not that bad. <laughs> they were the only band at the time that could play their own songs. Like everybody else was doing cover bands or cover oh, songs, okay. but their their band could play their own original music. Huh? That's how good they were, I guess. Wow. That's. Anyway. Um, Look, you can find us on social media, <laughs> uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, pin, uh, yeah, Instagram. Um, Instagram. Yeah, I don't know. You guys know how to get a hold of us if you want to do stuff. I don't know. We were supposed to do secret show tonight, but it's already 1021 here, which is why this is what I was talking about. But we're like, I don't think I want to do secret show. Tonight. No, that's fine. Yeah, and I, I just I can't do it this weekend. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's all right. That's all right. Um, it's this this one's on me. Normally they're on you guys. But this one is on me. That's my bad because it's just it's just too late. I don't want to get. Uh, yeah, and it. Yeah, yeah whatever. Um, here, let's do this real fast. The Twenty First Amendment Brewery's latest beer release, Tropical Brew Free or Die IPA, puts an island vacation in their whimsically designed cans. That's right, cans. This refreshing year-round release, Tropical IPA, is brewed with pale and Munich malts, brimming with azaka, citra cryo, and mosaic hops, and topped with a splash of pineapple flavor. The result is a clean, refreshing beer featuring a mix of sweet malt, balanced bitterness, fruit-forward hops, and a nice tropical vacation at the finish. Tropical Brew for Your Die IPA is available at your local good beer shop, neighborhood taproom, and anywhere else people come together to find great craft beer. Wonderful, wonderful job, Eric. You did great. Um, let's see. I put a bunch of stuff up on the Etsy page. Uh, true sweatshirts are back and masks are back, and you know some other stuff's back. So uh, if you've been dying to get some uh, some Etsy merch, you can go and do that over there. That's great. But the best way to support us, if you want, is Patreon. Go to Patreon.com/slash Ears Up, and you get a whole bunch of cool stuff uh, based on the tiers that you can select and the secret show, like we mentioned before. Um, and then, you know, the higher you go up on the tiers, you get like early access to the secret show. You get invited to uh, the walkabout videos that we do, which I think, I think the next one's going to be on the 29th, but I'll send a thing out. And um, I would love for you to join one of those, Bev. You don't have to, obviously. I don't really know. Like, what do we do? I don't really know what it is. So um, <laughs> we get on a call like this and I have like a list of YouTube videos, mostly are Disney related you know, in some way, shape or form. And then we just watch these like short videos and just comment on it. And then I end it with, so like, for example, I think last one we did, um, 
we did the Iron Man ride in Hong Kong. Like did a, a ride through of that and like talked about that and, you know, just kind of stuff like that. Oh, okay. Um, and then we finished with just weird videos that I found. Like I found Iron Man ride. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't even think I knew that. It's pretty sick too, oh. honestly. It looks pretty it's like sort of Star Toursy. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It's pretty rad. You got but, web slingers? Sorry. We, yes. And, and this is what I was saying uh, on the interview. It's like the the European uh parks get cooler <laughs> yeah. stuff than we do. Yeah. Seriously. I don't know why. Uh then I, I I wound up with like weird videos. Like one is like uh this dude had a terrarium for 12 years. <laughs> I don't know. What? Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's I, a good time. I find that stuff funny, man. <laughs> and like Dan was on and um, usually uh, RGH joins and, uh, you know, we just, I don't know, hang out and just, <laughs> it's different than what we do here. It's just a chance to hang out. And, uh, if, you know, depending on the level, if you're at, you can come and hang out with us and, you know, join the call and, you know, just whatever. But, uh, you know, people send in videos for us to watch and it's fun. I like it. I don't know. It's just a different, I was looking for a different thing. Cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? Speaking of different things, concierge, go to concierge.com. If you're trying to go to the parks, maybe you'll run into Josh there. You never know. Um, go to concierge.com, buy your park tickets from concierge.com. Even if you're going for a day or two and you don't need anything in these ancillary packages that they do, um, you know, it helps concierge out. Uh, it's the same price that you buy from the parks, but it also has that added benefit of if you want to get something to eat at Carthay Circle or you want to do this thing or you want to go to Blue Bayou or whatever, they can book all that stuff for you. And that is no extra charge. So uh, check them out, concierge.com. They also are doing cruises and doing packages to Disney World, all that kind of stuff. And I really don't think you should try to tackle going to Disney World without the backup of concierge. That's well, just it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. there's something interesting that I learned from their Instagram is that you can actually transfer your booking to concierge and they can then help you even so even if you've already kind of started it yourself you can transfer oh. it over to them and have them take over oh that's you put your cool. ticket package and yeah. stuff that's cool yeah that's nice i like that so if you ever were worried that like when we say that there's no added cost that there really is there's clearly not like you can do it yourself and then transfer it over or you can just let them do it <laughs> yeah there's uh yeah there's literally no added costs no, it's, guys. it's pretty sick I love sick. I love sick things, dude. Why do you have to? Well, it was a weird thing for me to say, <laughs> and then you had to call me out on it. <laughs> I just love sick stuff. I'm just, I'm sorry, dude. So I started researching uh, going back to Disney World <clears throat> yep. in like, I think we're going to go in like 2024 or 2025 or something. I have some weird potential ideas. Yeah. Like what? Um, so I made a spreadsheet Okay. and honestly, it is cheaper to stay on property, Yeah. but only at one particular place. Mm. And that would be the campsites. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, You're at gonna... uh, Fort Wilderness, but you can rent, like they have all these RV rental places where they'll like bring you an RV and they like hook it up. So you don't have to rent a car because they have all the transportation you need to get into the parks. Uh huh. They have all this like cool stuff for kids, pools, hot tubs. I don't know. I'm, I'm almost like a real hotel. <laughs> seriously, I'm seriously considering it. I like the I like the idea of having uh, um like a a stove because we could cook there yeah mm -hmm. absolutely that, that is the food thing was annoying at the in the hotel room yeah yeah absolutely i i, I hate going to disneyland without a, a kitchen in the in the hotel room yeah. just because and it's like you only really end up making popcorn but still it's it's nice yeah. to have that I mean, you can buy some frozen pizzas we yeah. we did that you you know there's just there's options and i like that yeah, absolutely so 2022 bev thinks that's a good idea. Will 2025 bed Bev hate 2022 Bev for well, making her sleep in an RV? I don't think so. Uh, because I don't think sleep, I don't mind sleeping in an RV and the ones that I'm looking at are not like the beds. It's a, it's a human bed. It's not like, <laughs> okay. it's not like an air mattress. Well, here's the thing. You don't mind sleeping in it, but do you want to, at the end of the day, 
That's what I think you have to well, look at. The thing at. is, is I don't think it matters because I was so tired every night. I could have slept on the floor. Okay. Got it. I mean, there is, there is a certain point where you realize you, you're, you're springing 500, $600 a night for a room at, a, at Disneyland, like, you know, Grand California. You're literally there for eight hours. That's exactly. it. Yeah. Exactly. So but what are you going to do? That was not the case when we went to Disney World, though. Like, we spent time at our resort and we. Yes, ate your resort was fancy. I did not spend time at my resort. Yeah, well, yeah. only because we got concierge, concierge level. Concierge level. Uh, concierge level. And so it's like, oh, okay, you mean there's free rose and yeah. uh, tea we got, cakes? Like, we got a place to be. It's the lobby. We got to go. <laughs> I'm actually staying at Paradise Pier. It's my first time staying at a Disneyland resort. Hmm. I'm staying there the first week of February. Cool. cool. Awesome. Yeah, we we're going to do we're going to do some things with Bev. That's going to be in April. In April. Okay. All right. And I think cool. it's either going to be the first week of April or the third week of April. I'm still narrowing that down. That's right. We have a, we have a, a couple cool ideas. I don't want to spoil it just yet in case those other nefarious podcasts steal our ideas, Bev. We're, we are, we're unique in the podcast space where we have, I don't know. I'm just I just remembered that I had a dream that just me and Bev went to Disneyland. I like that dream. And we just got drunk. <laughs> I'm literally just going to say we drank the whole time and we're besties. Yeah. That's, that's what it was awesome. Uh, I like that dream even more because I'm not there. There's no way I could deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. Well, we had fun. Well, that's good. I'm glad you guys have had pretend fun. <laughs> yeah it's been great <laughs> yeah i think that's great um god i feel like there's like a bunch of other stuff that, that i wanted to talk about on the show but i don't know it's i think 10 30. it's been it's been a good show yeah i think it's been a good show too i don't want to ruin it i do want to read this book um that josh was talking about though walt disney hollywood hollywood's dark <laughs> yeah, that's what i'm gonna do you can buy it on amazon one i am born three bucks um the book is called The First Truly Unauthorized Biography. And in the case of Disney, unauthorized is important because all previous authorized biographies had to pass the scrutiny of Disney Studios. <laughs> Without manuscript approval, the Disney archives were off limits to Elliot. Apparently he wrote uh, a book about Bruce Springsteen too. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, the darker side of Disney includes his co cooperation with the House Un-American Activities Committee and the FBI, as well as Uncle Walt's strong anti-union campaigns. Oh, I kind of want to read it now. <laughs> oh my God, wow. <clears throat> this, literally, this sentence talks about Walt on his marriage night, and I'm not going to really go into detail, but like, oh. I sort of now really desperately want to you know, buy this. And maybe I'll give it, oh, we should give it to Terrence as a, an assignment. He'll never, He'll do, never it. do it because he, yeah, he's not here. <laughs> No Parents is, uh, is busy at work, which I totally get. Except play songs on. Facebook. <laughs> well, look, everyone needs a mental break. <laughs> that's right? true. Everyone needs a mental health break. That is true. Um, all right. Well, that's it. Uh, thanks again to Josh Freeze. You can go to thejoshfreeze.com and uh, check out his uh, biography, his discography. This dude has his discography <laughs> laid out alphabetical, and it's like, most any band you've ever heard of this fool is on it so uh check him out man it's um yeah i don't know but uh i was listening to uh like the latest devo album which i never thought i would do and it sounds just like devo did in like the 70s and 80s man it's like yeah. it they just sound it sounds tight it's it's creative uh it's electronically loose it sounds really good nice. i don't know i'm really uh i'm pretty happy about it nice yeah um all right i guess that's it i don't know but check it out buy josh's new album um yeah it's fun like you said songs are under a minute if you don't like it you'll never know about it <laughs> skip to the next one nice i guess all right. yeah i guess i guess that's it i don't know why um, do you why are you i don't know because i because i have like other stuff i wanted to talk about I'm just, i don't know i just i'm doing Nothing, thing. none of your lists are working tonight for you no yeah no they're not it's, it's messing with your brain i think oh well but that's sort of what i do it's like a, a, sometimes i'm a car stuck in the mud where you just got to spin the tires a couple times and you got to go i guess that's it i guess that's it <laughs> i guess that and then you go okay then you're like a car you know yeah, and turning over and then you call the tow truck yeah <laughs> but the tow truck can't come until tomorrow so the tow truck's busy <laughs> at work <laughs> 
Which I can't make it here. <laughs> um, all right, everybody. Fact of the show. In the storybook canal boat ride at Disneyland, the mountains that serve as a backdrop for Cinderella's castle were sculpted by hand. Ken Anderson, designer of not only Fantasyland, but the canal boat refurbishment, used nothing but a trowel to mold wet concrete into these spiky crags you see today. I thought that was interesting because, I don't know, you just don't really think about like hand sculpting like that. And and there's a lot of mountains on that ride. So, um, yeah. all props to Ken Anderson, I guess. Cool. Anyway, uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you again to Josh for spending an ordinate amount of time with us. And uh, thank you all for listening in as well. And uh, until next time, we'll see you in the parks.